Good morning. Welcome to the conference on the 175th anniversary of Banco de Portugal. The conference is about the role of central banks in rebuilding social capital. Uh, thanks for joining us here at the Money Museum and through live streaming on our website. Uh, for the opening session, I invite Governor of Banco de Portugal, Mario Centeno, to come to the stage. Good morning. Good morning, all. Dear guests. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to Bank of Portugal and to the venue uh, of our conference, this beautiful money uh, museum. It is in itself a modest contribution to the social capital, the topic that brings us here. This conference that focuses on the role of central banks in rebuilding social capital is one uh, of the events promoted to celebrate the 175th anniversary of Banco de Portugal. The topic of today goes to the core of our social fabric. How we work together as Portuguese, as Europeans, indeed as global democracies. To motivate this morning debate, allow me to ask you to travel back in time with me, not very far. But let's go back, not to the year of the creation of Bank of Portugal, 1846, but only back five years to 2017. That was the year when Portugal exited an eight year period of non-compliance with European Union institutional framework regarding national budget deficits, the famous 3% threshold. It is part of the European social capital these days. By any standards, eight years of excessive deficits procedure is, allow me the pun, excessive. The social capital of Portugal in the European Union was probably at its lowest level. But according to an opinion poll conducted in mid-2017, that's why I'm taking you back to 2017, the fit of exiting the excessive deficit procedure increased the Portuguese self-esteem more than winning for the first time the European Football Cup or the Eurovision Song Contest. For you to have an idea as, uh, of how broad this effect was, I need to let you know that it was true for both the subsample of men and women. To me, this demonstrates how citizens value today in Portugal the commitment to social contracts. That is why central banks must nourish and enhance the social capital of our societies. It is essential for economic and social development. For that reason, our strategic plan motto for 2021-2025 is proximity and trust with those who, are, who, who we must serve, the Portuguese citizens. As a central bank, Banco de Portugal plays a key role in the process of consolidation of the country's social capital. We are committed to this build-up process so that together we can successfully overcome the challenges ahead. At this juncture in time, the historical challenges are considerable. In addition to the pressing debt legacy, climate change and digital transition challenges, particularly important in the traditional banking sector, the economy was hit by two exogenous, now partially overlapping shocks, the COVID pandemic 
and the Russia war on Ukraine. The short-term effects are very clear. The Russian invasion of Ukraine in itself is a demonstration of the lack of social capital. It is slowing down the recovery. Also, it is causing an inflationary environment, adding to the ones already in place and temporary due to the fast recovery from the COVID crisis. The new pressures on prices result from the escalation of commodity and energy prices, reduced confidence of economic agents, and the effects of commercial and financial sanctions imposed on Russia. In this context, a coordinated set of national and European policy actions is crucial to ensure sustainable growth in our economies. For the Portuguese economy, there are two main courses of action to overcome successfully the challenges ahead. At the national level, Portugal must continue to champion education. For many decades, which add up to centuries, Portugal lagged behind in the development race by neglecting the main driver, education. Claudia Goldin and Larry Katz have dubbed the 20th century as the human capital century. For Portugal, the 20th century arrived only on the 21st century. But ever since, we have been keen to take that opportunity. Knowing that social capital does not dep depreciate if used, on the contrary, it tends to enhance as we use it. We must remain resolute in the education front. This is a necessary condition, an absolute necess necessary condition to ensure our convergence within Europe. Moreover, by investing in education, we increase the equality of opportunities, we reduce income and wealth inequalities, and improve our labor force. Above all, we boost the country's social capital. We promote horizontal and participative institutions. The recent reaction to COVID crisis was, in Europe, a leap of integration. Because it was widely accepted by all Europeans, because it was the translation into action of a deep desire to sort out our common difficulties with a common action plan. This never happened as with such a great clarity uh, as in 2020 in Europe. This was made possible, we must understand that, by several years of risk reduction in Europe. This risk reduction made room to the biggest moment of creation of European social capital since the creation of the euro. And the next generation EU and its funding structure is, in my opinion, the reflect of this creation of social capital. That is why it is crucial to use productively the resources made available by the recovery and resilience plans. Only then can this enormous European effort materialize in a permanent increase in production capacity while promoting a greener and more digital economy without compromising fiscal constraints. It was the first time that Europe thought about not compromising fiscal constraints. From a political perspective, or shall I say, from a social capital perspective, this is also a defining moment for the first time in its history, Europe issued common debt, a absolute no-go, not that long ago. And believe me, I witnessed that 
in my previous position. But that comes with an increased responsibility. All countries need to deliver on the implementation of their transition programs. Failing to achieve it would not only constitute an economic loss, but also impose a setback in the construction of a solid European institutional framework. More than ever, policy decisions should enhance the role of social contracts when complementing monetary and fiscal policies. The trust in the euro, measured by the Eurobarometer, usually, historically, suffers with European crises. Well, not this time. On the contrary, during the COVID crisis, the trust in the euro reached a maximum in 2020. And this was absolutely remarkable. Europeans considered the euro for the first time, as in general during a crisis, as part of the solution, not as part of the problem. Because the euro institutions, of course, including our NCBs and the euro system, delivered in a collective way. In this vein, with a special focus on maintaining the stability and predict predictability of its actions, Bank de Portugal is currently engaged in building a closer relationship with citizens, enhancing a more relevant and active coordination with institutional players. This includes national and international institutions and also the academia. We are also deepening the exchange of information with market participants. We aim to promote and widen the public debate on the economy and on Europe. We aim to be interpreters uh, for the society of financial and economic developments, and especially financial stability. Remember the poll. Moreover, Bank de Portugal is expanding its work on financial literacy to domains such as economic and statistical, statistical literacy. These areas of knowledge are fundamental for informed decision-making, contributing on its own on the enhancement of the Portuguese social capital as well. As a central bank, we have, a unique, obli we have a unique obligations and we uh, will use our technical capabilities credibility and independence to this endeavor. We have an outstanding panel of distinguished guests today. Thank you all for making the time and the opportunity to be here with us. From academia to policymakers, if such a distinction makes sense when discussing social capitals, all of those are presented here. I am eager, of course, to hear your views on how central banks can improve social capital, not only in the domains uh, of their core mandates regarding price stability and financial stability, but also concerning employment, output growth, income distribution, and climate change. The theoretical foundations of social capital are well established today. Allow me to recall the work by Harvard's Robert Putnam, but also of Professor Harold James, that we are so fortunate to uh, have here with us today. Your great contribution, Professor, to this topic improved the way central banks can think of themselves in their key contributions to our societies. And without further delay, I welcome Professor Harold James, to share with us a keynote speech on the role of central banks in rebuilding social capital. Thank you all. The floor is yours, Professor. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Governor Centeno, for your hospitality and your great welcome. It's wonderful to be here and to think about this uh, important topic. 
think. And uh, it's, uh, I think, an auspicious occasion on the celebration of the 175th anniversary of the foundation of the uh, Banco de Portugal. But it's also obviously a frightening and worrying moment in the aftermath of two years of a pandemic. Uh, the last time I was in Lisbon uh, was almost precisely two years ago um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and now in the middle uh, of a security uh, crisis in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But it, not just in the wake of those crises, uh, the last 12 years have been very difficult. Industrial societies have been overwhelmed by a tidal wave of distrust. I wanted to take as a guide, um, can I click this on? So, sorry about this. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. So I, I wanted to take as a guide um, Elvis Presley, um, and particularly the uh, great song, Suspicious Minds. We can't go on together with Suspicious Minds, Suspicious Minds, and we can't build our dreams on suspicious minds. What is the basis of suspicion or the breakdown of social trust? I think the doubts are on two levels. First, concern about the competence or effectiveness of governments and political institutions in managing responses to economic, medical, diplomatic, security, military emergencies. And secondly, fears about a loss of privacy in a world dominated by information controlled primarily by pri private companies or big tech that may manipulate price signals in order to influence and mold behavior through complex and intransparent algorithms. These worries build on each other and I think they are what creates the paranoid mindset, suspicious minds. Social capital and uh, Governor Centeno already referred to this, social capital is built through robust interpersonal connections, trust in others, and a backstop in the form of legal enforcement. Trust in price signals, the specific responsibility of central banks, is a vital component of the way in which we interact. Rapidly changing prices either inflation or deflation, undermine the basis of trust. The heart of the mission of central banks is generating this kind of specific trust. In the global financial crisis, especially after 2010, central banks were at the center of crisis management and crisis containment. That was a consequence of politics or maybe more specifically, the result of political failure. For different reasons, the US, the UK, and the Eurozone all moved to quite abrupt fiscal tightening and backed off from the 2008 to 9 mantra of coordinated anti-crisis fiscal stimulus. So central banks were left holding this rather fragile baby of the world economy. And they're then described as rock stars, or the only grown-ups in the room, the only adults in the room. It's tempting to think after this experience, after the successes of dealing with the global financial crisis in the sense that there was no repeat of the Great Depression, no repeat of the interwar Great Depression, in the financial response to the COVID crisis, these are really uniquely successful. And now central banks are again providing a crucial weapon in the fight against Vladimir Putin's aggression. It's not surprising then that the role of central banks has brought relief, 
and praise, but also a kind of backlash or a criticism. All over the world, central banks seem to stand right at the center of social fissures. In the United States, there's long been an anti-Fed sentiment on the right, on the far right, on the left, um, on the far left, and the global financial crisis uh, produced more demands to audit the Fed. Amid a heightened concern with racial and social equity, it looked as if the central bank's action had driven up asset prices and fueled a rise in wealth inequality. In Europe, the ECB and appointments to its boards became a part of an epic struggle between North and South. The Bank of England was criticized for political interventions in the 2010 elections, for being sympathetic to the Remain cause before and even after the 2016 referendum, and now for calling for wage moderation as part of an anti-inflation strategy. Uh, the Financial Times economics comment commentator, Martin Sanbu, uh, tweeted, why does the governor of the Bank of England encourage restraint in wage demands, but not call for restraint in businesses' attempts to protect their profit margins? Is it intellectual bias, ideology, greater resignation with regard to price than wage setting, or something else? If central banks can do a lot, and I think that was exactly the experience of the last decade, central banks could do an awful lot, they actually can't clearly do everything. They can't make vaccines, antiviral drugs, or for that matter, anti-tank missiles. They can't live up to everybody's expectations in societies that have become more and more polarized. And this, I think, is a classic tragedy of rising expectations. Central banks promise stability, they create expectations of more stability, and then they're bound to encounter disenchantment when the world turns out to be uncertain, insecure, and threatening. That's precisely Elvis's trap. I can't w walk out because I love you too much, baby. Why can't you see what you're doing to me when you don't believe a word I say? How can central banks' declarations of their credibility really be expected to evoke trust if projections and assurances are turning out to be so unreliable. What exactly should central banks do in this situation? It's really hard to claim that they should concentrate on making better guesses about an unpredictable future. That's especially true when we don't know and we can't know about geopolitical uncertainty, the pace of climate change, or even the dynamics of social disintegration. Today, I think the balance is different to 2010. Instead of the worry then about debt, there's perhaps today too much of a confidence that high levels of government debt can be sustainably financed, and too much belief that there are really easy solutions. COVID led to a push for governments to do more, and at the same time, increased the extent of fiscal strain. Greater military expenditure, clearly needed now, new price surges, shortages, scarcities, the need to deal with the humanitarian challenge of large refugee movements, all this is going to add to the strain. And it's good, as uh, Governor Centeno said, uh, that there was a period in which there was a resilience that was built up in advance of this. This is exactly what resilience is supposed to do. But the effect of the past decade as well as the new extent of the strain, leads, I think, to the assumption that central banks will be pushed by politics to fall in line. There's a profound challenge here because the successes of the 2010s relied fundamentally on the assumption that government debt in advanced countries and also in many but not all key emerging markets is practically free from inflation risk and that governments will, in consequence, be able to borrow from investors at a lower rate than the investors themselves use to discount the future. 
This can be thought of as the extraordinary, the extraordinary privilege of the safe asset. So it's a consequence of the success of central banks in terms of what was regarded in the late 20th century as the primary task of central banks, delivering on price stability. So this is what makes all that extraordinary action of the last decade or 12 years or 14 years really possible. And price stability is clearly at the core of what people think of when they try to define what a modern central bank should do. It's the way that in the 1970s, uh, the Fed's mandate was redefined with the dual mandate of price stability and an employment criteria, a full employment criteria. It's behind the formulation of the ECB statute. It's behind the 1998 Bank of England Act, which for the first time in history gave a really clear definition in a statute, in a piece of legislation, of what the bank's task uh, should be. But it's interesting, I think, and important when we're thinking, and that's the opportunity that a historical conference gives us, a uh, reflection on 140, uh, 175 years of history of the, of the Bank of Portugal. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity uh, to think of whether this was uh, always what central banks were doing. In fact, this is really quite new, this concentration on price stability. And uh, the tasks of central banks before that were really defined in terms of two other sets of priorities. Um, First of all, then, public debt management. That's why the Bank of Portugal was founded or why the Banque de France was founded. Um, and I think it goes back uh, to 1694 and the creation of the Bank of England. And the Bank of England looked like a unique success and it was then admired by Alexander Hamilton or by Napoleon and taken as a model to be applied in the First Bank of the United States or in the Banque de France. And uh, the primary purpose of the Bank of England when it was created was to manage the public debt and it, it succeeded in doing that and in pushing down interest rates as a result of that successful management. But the purpose of that, what was the purpose of it? Um, I talked about the 1998 legislation saying that the purpose of the Bank of England is price stability. But in 1694, what the statute defines as the purpose of the Bank of England is particularly security. It's carrying on the war against France is the language of the statute that creates the uh, Bank of England. Um, it then, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, with the beginning of a phase of financial globalization, and big cross-border capital movements, there's a new object, a new objective of central banks, um, financial stability and the central banks that are created in the late 19th century don't really have the objectives that the first generation of central banks, including the Banco de Portugal, uh, have. Uh, and they're much more focused on financial stability. The German Reichsbank, the predecessor of the Bundesbank, was created not with the German Empire in 1871, but a few years afterwards, and primarily as a response to a big financial crisis in 1873. And the Federal Reserve System uh, was created a long, long time after the creation of the American Republic in 1914 in the aftermath of a severe financial crisis in 1907. And the legislation uh, that creates both those banks makes that point very, very specifically. So when central banks are rethought 
in the late 20th century. They are actually repurposed to avoid those focuses. In the 1990s, when central banks are redesigned, the redesign involves, in many cases, eliminating both debt management and a financial stability mandate, precisely in order to ensure price stability by removing responsibilities that might conflict with price stability. There's a danger of fiscal dominance when high debt levels mean that central banks worry that they're damaging the government's balance sheet by raising interest rates. And there's a danger of a parallel danger of financial dominance when a large banking sector is threatened by insolvency and requires and pushes for and lobbies for a general raising of asset prices in order to avoid that fate. So when the Bank of England was redesigned in 1997 and 1998, government debt management and financial supervision were both taken away from the Bank of England. The financial supervision mandate uh, in the ECB is stated in a deliberately vestigial way and uh, the debt financing, uh, direct debt financing is of course prohibited. This looked like a way of solving problems. The only way that central banks, it was argued, could foster financial stability was by fostering a macroeconomic environment and low and stable inflation and sustainable economic growth. And with debt management, the claim at that time was that it was better for the central bank to treat the government as simply another, albeit large, borrower. These positions were, as they were formulated in the 1990s, too extreme. It was inevitable after 2008, when financial crisis came back big time, that the concerns that had motivated these historical creations in the first place would appear again, and the old tasks become central once more. Those old functions, debt management and financial supervision, involve interventions in the cost of credit or the business of lending that affect the price of assets. And they're both central to the task of stabilizing the social fabric, building or rebuilding social capitalism. That was exactly the attraction of the post-2010 crisis interventions. There's a famous phrase uh, coined, I think, by Jeremy Stein, but it may be that somebody said this earlier, that the great thing about money is that it gets into every crack. It's everything that you need to fix everything, a polyfiller. Um, but it's exactly that successful stabilization of expectations that produces a pushback. Is it either really desirable or even feasible to push resources in every direction? Central banks were supposed to pour liquidity into the growing and profound fissures of civil society. But what if those fissures were really bottomless pits? Shouldn't there then be a policy emphasis that ensured that poorer or more remote people should get better access to credit? Should there be a way of thinking about credit as a way of building a more environmentally sustainable future? Recently, central banks have addressed both these issues explicitly, but they're highly, highly controversial. The new nominee of the Biden administration for the Fed's bank regulation position, Sarah Bloom Raskin, said that financial regulators should consider how regulatory changes rating, relating to disclosure, access to credit, and pricing of risk support support a rapid and just green transition. But when she came under pressure in the nomination process, she retreated to the observation that it's inappropriate for the Fed to make credit decisions and allocations based on choosing winners and losers. And even with that retreat, 
it wasn't enough. The administration then dropped her candidacy. It's clear why there is this problem. Both debt management and bank regulation can easily be subject to abuse. In the first case, we call it fiscal dominance. In the second, we call it financial dominance. Credit expansions designed to combat fiscal disequilibrium or a threat of financial crisis may end up by augmenting both and producing, in the end, greater vulnerability to collapses and reversals. So these old functions of central banks, the debt management, the financial stability, are ones that provoke just as much dissent because they have really profound distributional consequences. In the case of the Eurozone, buying government securities was justified as ensuring the effective transition, transmission of monetary policy. But buying corporate bonds raises another set of issues. Should the central bank try to shape the economy so as to make it more productive or resilient? What criteria should it use to determine what's environmentally sustainable? Or should, if you think that the environment has changed since February the 24th, or the risks have changed since February the 24th of this year, uh, should, for instance, armaments manufacturers be regarded as equally vital to the securing of a decent future as environmental investments? And should they be accorded preferential access to credit facilities? It was exactly those kind of arguments in the interwar period when central banks did do that kind of intervention and they tried to push credit in particular ways to particular sectors of the economy that launched a discussion about whether central bank independence had been abused and whether it should, in consequence, be ended. So we have a set of issues after the COVID, after uh, Ukraine, in which there's much more uncertainty. And I think an easy way of thinking about the uncertainty is in terms of thinking about how it relates to inflation expectations. Initially, in response to the COVID crisis, uh, there was widely thought to be a risk of deflation, and that would, I think, justify the continuation of the post-2008 or 2010 course. Or other now, as it appears, rather more dangers on the inflation side. And in particular, as inflation risks appear to be greater and more likely to be sustained, in the wake of massive and ongoing commodity and supply chain shocks that will linger on for some time, some of the old arguments in favor of central bank independence will appear again. And it's, it's worth thinking about how those debates occurred in the past and how they played out in the past. In the aftermath of the First World War, and we can think of the COVID crisis as a warlike emergency in which exceptional measures are needed. But what happens when you move out of that? In the aftermath of the First World War, um, central banks were justifying their position initially when they were accommodating inflation as the result of a patriotic necessity, uh, accepting fiscal dominance was a patriotic necessity. But exactly the same language occurs after the Second World War. And I think very interestingly, in the debate about Fed independence and Fed autonomy in the aftermath of the Second World War and uh, the great crisis in relations between the US government and the Federal Reserve System in 1951, which produced the Fed Accord. And uh, the background of that crisis was again a national emergency uh, in the Korean War. And uh, Harry Truman summoned in 
the entire Fed Open Market Committee uh, and gave them a lecture about patriotic necessity. Uh, he emphasized, this is the quotation from the minutes of that meeting in the White House, he emphasized that we must combat communist influence on many fronts. He said that one way to do this is to maintain confidence in the government's credit and in government securities. He felt that if people lose confidence in government securities, all we hope to gain from our military mobilization and war, if need be, might be jeopardized. And um, at that point, he was challenged uh, by the former chair of the Fed, who was still on the board, um, Mariner Echoes, a major dissident who was then very hawkish on inflation, but also laid out the alternative in terms of foreign policy because Eccles didn't like the Korean War and he worried that the United States was stumbling into an uncharted Asian morass, this is the quote from that same transcript, without reckoning the costs. So what's the modern equivalent to this argument about national security? I think uh, when I originally contemplated uh, this, this discussion uh, before the 24th of February, um, I, I thought, well, it's, it's really impossible that the language of national security appears again, at least in Europe or the United States. Um, it might appear in other countries. It appears, for instance, very clearly uh, when Turkey's President Erdogan um, sacks one central bank governor after another and accuses the central bank of giving in to an international lobby of currency rate speculators and interest rate lobby, credit rating agencies and so on. Um, but uh, I, I think now uh, we have an issue where we have the, uh, the new security needs uh, but also the older priorities in terms of thinking of climate change, the uh, sustainable future, as an overriding national or supranational uh, European global uh, interest. Um, the wider activity of central banks, the expansiveness of their mission, if you take all this literally, if you take the national security arguments, if you take the environmental arguments seriously, it points, I think, clearly in one direction, that central banks need to be more firmly embedded in the overall institutional framework of a democratically elected government. With such ambitious tasks, with broad and potentially unknown and unknowable political and social implications, they can't just be left as a delegated operation focusing on one narrow goal, price stability. Well, I was tempted initially just to leave it at that, but I don't think it would be right to leave it at that, uh, because there is very distinctly, and that's where I started from, also a need for monetary stability. But it's changed. The discussion of credit and credit-based money today is very different than it was in the past mainly because the credit and debt economy has taken off so spectacularly. We're not dealing mostly when we deal with money anymore, with public money, central bank money, but almost entirely with privately generated money, a credit. In the UK, for instance, uh, just 3% of money held by the public is in the form of notes or cash, and the rest is in bank deposits. There are two sources of weakness, particularly in an era of pervasive uncertainty that inevitably goes with deep structural and technical change. And what we're seeing at the moment and why the inflation debate is so difficult is that it's not just an overall aggregate movement of prices evenly in one upward direction, but it's a very sharp movement of, of differential prices, of price differentials. So in this uncertainty, the two sources of difficulty are this. First, credit is based on confidence and is vulnerable to sudden reversals and to bad news. Regulation may try to contain those vulnerabilities, but then the source of risk shifts to unregulated areas, away from banking to private finance or non-bank lending into the crypto world. So the risks in new areas increase 
And then it's only after they've been fully exposed and probably only after a new crisis that there's really a sense, a clear sense of what to regulate. The second weakness is more fundamental, but also I think deserves consideration. If you think about what credit-based money or private money is based on, it requires the accumulation of information about the borrowers. It's possible in that sense to develop a futuristic scenario, maybe it's a utopia or maybe it's a dystopia, in which everything depends on credit that's linked to information held by giant companies operationalized through algorithms. And those who would be unwilling or unable to supply that information are cut out. Already, I think there's a clear differentiation between countries in terms of access to banking. The proportion of the unbanked varies considerably. There's a nice ECB study of this. In the Eurozone as a whole, the population without access to banking is much lower than it is in the United States, where this is really a major social problem and a problem about uh, social trust and the social fabric. But in some countries, it's considerably higher. And it's not surprising that those are also the countries where there's less trust and social capital is more uncertain. There's thus a strong argument pro for providing a standardized public currency that doesn't depend on credit alone. Or we could think of it as a token-based currency. Existing notes and coins do this, but they can't be used in as many transactions or as conveniently as bank transfers can be managed. And that is a cost that is imposed on the poor and the most vulnerable. That's exactly the case for the provision of central bank digital currency, as it was laid out uh, very clearly uh, by my colleagues and friends, Marcus, Landau, uh, Marcus Brunnemeyer and Jean-Pierre Landau, in their report for the European Parliament, the digital euro policy implications and perspectives. There is stability and efficiency, but also justice arguments in making a stable store of value available to all citizens. Uh, that would help to bridge the banking and the digital divide. In a period when money is in flux, because of technical innovation around blockchain technology, the provision of certain non-credit-based money is once again a priority that might offer a source of stability. Stabilizing the social fabric would in particular involve extending the certainties of money to citizens who at present don't have bank accounts. It's precisely the privacy concerns, the expectation that we have that public authorities must be above the fray, that suggests that central banks shouldn't extend their functions into an all-pervasive micromanagement of credit. And that kind of extension would really be a big brother or a superior version of a Soviet-style central planner. There's a need to continue to operate a general monetary policy on the basis of a stable unit of account. Where that isn't provided, and this isn't really the discussion, I think, in, in uh, Europe or the United States, but it is the discussion in many parts of the world, in Central Asia or in South America, uh, when governments can't provide this kind of basic uh, provision of a stable currency, the demand is taken up by private and most likely less transparent and less reliable manufacturers of alternatives that claim to be stable. And here, finally, some really frightening possibilities open up. It's possible to imagine extended, as it were, optimal digital currency areas where like-minded people with similar consumption and behavioral patterns interact through money as a binding common language, independent of state frontiers, but binding particular communities together. Some people think of this as a benign future of self-realization, but it's possible also to see it as the promoter or accelerator of a new sectarianism. <laughs>
Indeed, some figures on the American right are starting to think of an alternative metaverse in which there are separate dating networks. Uh, Peter Thiel has founded something called the right stuff because conservatives deserve an easy way to connect. Separate communication platforms with a video sharing rumble replacing YouTube, messenger services, and finally money where a blockchain MAGA coin Make America Great coin, has been launched as a stable or deflationary option for the MAGA community, the Make America Great community, with the intention of also using the resources generated to finance MAGA activities. There can just as well be left-wing alternatives to that. Indeed, some existing blockchain systems have different political flavors, with Ethereum and XRP more to the left than the more conservative or libertarian Bitcoin. If this is so, this would offer a risk of political societies that are just tearing themselves apart, divided by different monies, with fragmented subunits, measuring their strength by their relative exchange rates. A key test of the effectiveness and the credibility of central banks will thus derive not from the ability to manage the credit-based economy, but also increasingly from the demand of citizens for stability and for an alternative to the yo-yo instability of the credit economy and the inherent divisiveness of private currencies, that dystopia of the MAGA coin world. Citizens want a center of stability in a world of radically changing expectations. That, I believe, is the way that central banks can and should contribute to building social capital and to calm or reassure the suspicious minds that Elvis Presley warned us about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Harold James. We will now break for 15 minutes and we'll come back at 10.14. Uh, Thank you.
question. A new social contract for central banks in times of shifting societal concerns. This session will have two panels. Uh, the chair for both panels is Pedro Duarte Neves from Bank de Portugal. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, and good morning to everybody again. Uh, let me start by saying that it's really a great privilege for me to be moderator of this session in such an important event for the bank. Let me now move on by introducing this session, which has two panels. The last 15 years have brought very demanding challenge for central banks. The growing multiplicity and complexity of roles has fundamentally changed the nature of central banking, bringing more responsibilities and much higher expectations among citizens. Central banks are required to play a more influential role, creating confidence and greater understanding of their missions. Strengthening trusts and promoting proximity with society becomes preponderant in parallel with greater accountability and transparency. This session addresses precisely the role of central banks in the current challenging times, aiming to answer the following questions. How should central banks contribute to rebuilding social capital? How should we improve the social contract for central banks? How should central banks reinforce accountability frameworks and enhance effectiveness, transparency, and trust? The first panel is precisely on social capital and financial stability. Financial stability is an essential contribution of central banks to social capital. The role in preserving financial stability is, is significantly more demanding today than it was before the great financial crisis. Financial reforms were decisive to rebuild social capital, restoring trust in market mechanisms and institutions. The reform process is, however, not completed and may, many changes to lie in the years ahead. This panel is going to address questions like the following. What is still missing in regulatory reform? What, which are the lessons learned on the functioning of the macroprudential framework? Which improvements in policy frameworks, monetary and macroprudential, could reduce incidence of financial crisis episodes? How should monetary policy take into consideration financial stability considerations, given that price stability and financial stability are both essential contributions to social capital? We are really very lucky to have four uh, distinguished participants on this panel. Athanasius Orphanitz, professor at MIT Sloan School of Management and former governor of the Central Bank of Cyprus, who is joining us from Boston uh, via WebEx. Claudio Borio, all of you know him as the head of monetary and economic department at BIS. Lucrezia Reichling, Professor of Economics at London Business School and the first chair of the CPR Euro Area Business Cycle Dating Committee, and Pablo Hernández de Cos, uh, Governor of Banco de España and chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Uh, each one will have uh, 10 minutes for the initial uh, presentation, and we'll start precisely with uh, Athanasius. Good morning, Athanasius, and, and thanks for joining us so early in the day for you, and we look forward for your presentation. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Pedro. I, I hope you can uh, uh, hear me well. Uh, it's an honor to participate at this uh, celebration of the 175th anniversary of the uh, Banco de Portugal, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that I cannot be there with you. Uh, uh, we are still not quite out of the uh, uh, pandemic, but hopefully uh, soon uh, uh, all of the restrictions we currently have will, will be uh, lifted. But I am grateful for the invitation, uh, uh, in particular, to discuss the role of central banks in rebuilding uh, social uh, capital. As Governor Centeno noted in his introduction, this is about, quote, how we work together. It's so important if the European project is to succeed, if it is to succeed, European institutions, governments and citizens must all work better together and not against each other. And this is still work in progress, and I hope that we would be making progress as we move uh, ahead. Indeed, the title of the conference suggests rebuilding is in order. 
it's important to recognize past policy errors that harmed social capital in Europe. Learning from past mistakes is how uh, institutions grow and become great institutions uh, over time. Rebuilding social capital is fundamental for the success of the European Union. The Union is founded on shared values with the objective to promote the well-being of its people. Towards that end, the Union's decision-making bodies, including its independent institutions, have the responsibility to promote growth, economic and social cohesion, and solidarity among member states. This is clear-cut. It's Article 3 of the Treaty that we all take as, as, as given as part of the mandate of all institutions in Europe. Of course, financial stability is a prerequisite for these goals. To meet the Union's objectives, financial stability must be achieved everywhere in the Union. And this is important to, to understand. Stability in parts of the Union, supporting growth and social progress in some member states, for example, is incompatible with the Treaty if it's accompanied by instability elsewhere in the Union. This is why it's so important to work together. ECB policies in particular that promote stability in some member states, but instability in other states is contrary to the mandate of the ECB and against the interest of Europe. And I will focus on this point since we're discussing the role of central banks in this session. Now, this role of central banks is most important in crises such as the Euro crisis uh, from, from a decade ago, and more recently, the COVID uh, uh, crisis from two years ago. When crises occur, uh, policies that are known to contribute to divergences are contrary to the Union's goals. And yet, unfortunately, we have not been free of such policies uh, in the context uh, uh, of the European Union and the Euro area uh, over the past uh, dozen uh, uh, years. Since the creation of the Euro, the Union's record in this respect has been decidedly mixed. As is well known, the Euro, fared, the Euro area fared pretty badly in managing the very first serious crisis it ever faced, the global financial crisis that then morphed into, into the Euro crisis uh, in, in Europe. Now, in the aftermath of that crisis, some governments successfully used their leverage over common institutions to protect narrow interests of those member states over the common good. This contributed to greater financial stability, faster growth in some member states, but not everywhere. Indeed, in some member states, we know very well we had catastrophic instability and avoidable misery imposed on the uh, peoples of those member states, which is clearly a violation of the letter and the spirit of the treaty. The success of the Union rests on shared prosperity. Unfortunately, a decade was lost with the Euro crisis. Uh, and this is what we need to make up. More recently, uh, while the initial response to the pandemic showed a similar predisposition by the governments of some member states to protect the national interest over the common good, and I, re I remember the chaos watching from far away in uh, February uh, and early March uh, in, in 2020, this changed quickly, and I, I believe we're very fortunate in Europe that within weeks of the start of the pandemic, it was recognized that solidarity and the common response to the pandemic was so critical for the well-being of all. This was a well-managed crisis, considering all the devastation uh, from, from the pandemic. As the most powerful common independent institution, the ECB's responsibility in the success uh, of the European Union, especially in the Euro area, is tremendous. Unfortunately, as already mentioned, in the Euro crisis, that did not work out very well. Uh, uh, and we need to compare the two, the Euro crisis and the pandemic, to draw lessons for the future. The ECB response to the pandemic was considerably uh, better than, than what we saw in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Euro crisis, in part because the ECB temporarily suspended application of its own earlier decisions that were known to induce divergences and instability uh, in the euro area. So the euro area was much better able to contribute to financial stability and in this way contribute to cohesion and solidarity in Europe because of critical decisions during taken during the pandemic that effectively undid earlier flaws 
let me remind you of one fundamental flaw uh, in the ECB policy framework that contributed to much of the carnage that we had seen uh, with the euro crisis. Unlike any other central bank, the ECB has been relying on credit rating agencies such as DBRS, for those of you who are familiar with that agency, to determine whether government debt of member states uh, would be eligible for ECB operations. No other central bank uh, anywhere uh, operates at the cost. Let me remind you uh, what the ECB policy was, uh, was doing in Portugal uh, in 2016. So I will share just uh, uh, two slides uh, uh, to that uh, uh, to that effect, and uh, I I hope you can see my slides now. Can you see the slide uh, uh, correctly? If you can confirm, I cannot hear you, unfortunately. No, we're seeing slides well. Okay, good. Very so well. it, you can. You, so uh, thank you. So you can see if you say what was wrong with uh, with with monetary policy in Portugal in uh, in in 2016. Well, we have this issue that uh, uh, the MPRS, uh, uh was uh, contemplating whether uh, to downgrade uh, uh, Portugal or not. This uh, little known uh, credit rating uh, agency based in Toronto, and this led to this very very peculiar configuration of interest rates where we had. Well, the ECB was pursuing quantitative easing and easing policy actively in, in many member states and in the euro area overall. And you can see I have in the slides the, uh, for example, 10-year OIS rate is, 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 is going down. Uh, German government bond yields are going down as well. Uh, Portuguese monetary condi conditions were actually tightening, uh, even though this was not warranted by, by Fundamenta. Why, what was the reason? Well, the reason was this reliance of the ECB uh, on DBRS uh, to determine whether whether Portuguese government debt would be eligible for uh, for monetary policy uh, in uh, uh, in in Portugal or not. And of course, you know that this is incredibly incredibly costly uh, by forcing the Portuguese government to pay a few percentage points above uh, what was warranted in order to refinance its, its cost. That means taxes had to be higher in Portugal. That means social spending and investment uh, had to be lower, all because this is what the ECB decided by delegating uh, its policy to a credit rating agency. Now, more recently, the ECB was very close to another crisis in Europe. And it, indeed, in March of, uh, uh, of 2020, oops, I'm sorry about this. Okay. In March of 2020, bond markets were close to a collapse uh, uh, and numerous interventions, including bond purchases by the ECB, were necessary to maintain uh, uh, stability. And there was one most important decision the ECB took. This was on April 22nd of, uh, uh, of 2020, when the ECB uh, decided to safeguard stability in the euro area by effectively suspending its reliance on the MBRS and other credit rating agencies to determine the eligibility of government debt for monetary policy operations. This was incredibly, incredibly important uh, for the euro area, a fantastic policy response by the ECB. Now, why do I bring this up in this context? Because we want to learn from this experience and ensure that good decisions stay forward, bad decisions are not being repeated. Unfortunately, while the ECB uh, in 2020 and 2021 underwent a long overdue review of its policy strategy, uh, it decided not to address this fundamental issue uh, in its policy strategy review and left that, left that, that question open. And uh, uh, as I was preparing these remarks last week, I realized that on March 24th, the ECB decided to return to the same destabilizing framework that was in place before the pandemic. As you can see here from the last week's decision, the ECB will no longer maintain the eligibility of, market, of marketable assets. And it does not actually tell you what this does, so I need to translate in the next bullet. The translation of the ECB decision is that it once again invites DMBRS and other credit rating agencies to determine the eligibility of government debt for its operations. Once again, invite occasional avoidable crisis once again penalize the people of most member states by raising the cost of financing of government debt and promote divergences 
contrary to the ECB mandate. So I'm bringing this up with you today because in the topic of the conference, we want to identify where we can do better. In my view, clearly, this was a step backward from the ECB and that, that I hope will be soon uh, corrected. Let me end by pointing out, we all know, uh, John Monet famously remarked, Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted for those crises. And indeed, before the founding of the ECB, Europe progressed every, after every crisis in the manner envisioned by Monet. This is not the experience we have had, unfortunately, since the creation of the ECB. The euro was a decade that took us backwards in Europe. In accordance with its mandate and to rebuild social capital in Europe, I think it's very important for the ECB to draw on good decisions and discard bad decisions it has taken in the past to contribute to stability and rebuild cohesion. Policies that cause unnecessary instability must be discarded. For Europe to succeed, the ECB must be part of the solution uh, of Europe's crisis. Thank you. Thought provoking presentation and for keeping to the time. Uh, we move uh, now to Claudio. Claudio Bloy, body of the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here to celebrate the 175th anniversary, no less, of uh, your central bank. Um, now, as we know by now, this conference is about uh, rebuilding social capital and the role of central banks in in that context. Um, now, I would like to address just one key aspect uh, in the bigger picture, which has concerned me for, for some time. And that is, and going back to uh, something that um, uh, we heard before from Harold, uh, a kind of expectations gap between what central banks are expected to, to deliver and what they can actually deliver, which of course can complicate, uh, complicate the fulfillment of their mandates and uh, has the potential, let me stress the potential of ultimately raising questions about the legitimacy, uh, legitimacy of central banks in the eyes of, of the public and therefore also um, undermine the pressures autonomy, or I prefer the term autonomy to independence, that central banks, uh, that is so useful for central banks to fulfill that mandate. So I think that the, the challenge in, in this context is to how to strengthen this implicit social contract between the central bank and, and society by trying to, to narrow that gap. So let me highlight three instances um, of what I call exaggerated expectations. And for the first, let me choose a rather obscure corner, if you like, of uh, policy, which is macro prudential policy which is a task for which central banks everywhere in one way or the other are co-responsible. Now, by now, I think we're all familiar with what uh, macroprudential policy is. If you like, it's a new kid on the block, which was implemented post great financial crisis to promote financial stability more, more effectively. And by the way, this is a policy that uh, the BIS uh, advocated from at least the early 2000s. So the basic idea, just to remind everyone, is to complement the long-standing focus of prudential regulation and supervision on individual financial institutions taken on a standalone basis with one that sees them as part of the financial system as a whole so that the focus is on, on systemic risk. Now, a key task in that context, not the only one, but a key task is to tackle what one might call the, the domestic financial cycle which is outsize uh, expansions and contractions in credit, in asset prices, particularly property prices and risk taking that are at the core of much of the financial instability that we have seen and big economic damage. Now, in the uh, financial liberalized world in which we, we live, the, the domestic financial cycle on top tends to be uh, fueled uh, by the pro-cyclical behavior of global financial conditions, what has sometimes been called the global financial cycle. These are two different concepts, especially, of course, in emerging market economies. Now, the ta the, this task, the task of macroprudential policy, has become so important uh, 
as a result of a subtle but very important uh, change in the nature of the business cycle since the 1980s, mid-1980s, I would say, from what I would call inflation-induced to financial cycle-induced recessions. What do I mean by that? Well, until the mid-1980s, recessions were caused by inflation going up, monetary policy tightening, with little changes in what you might call indicators of, of the financial cycle. Now, since then, by contrast, and COVID recession aside, inflation we know has been stable until recently, I'll come back to that. And so there was no need for monetary policy tightening. So what happened was the great financial expansion sort of turning into a contraction and the great financial crisis, I think, is the clearest example of that. Now, the problem is that um, macroprudential policy has often been regarded as the answer to the, these phenomena, to the financial cycles, including, importantly, and this is the key, in communication. Now, in fact, of course, macroprudential policy is only part of the answer. And one piece of evidence for that is that even in the countries in which macroprudential policy has been used very, very aggressively, this is mainly emerging market economies, we have still seen the emergence of the signs of the kinds of financial imbalance that tend to generate the problems I discussed earlier. Now, as a result of these exaggerated expectations, other policies have not played their part. And especially here, I'd like to highlight fiscal policy, which after all is the cornerstone of uh, financial stability. And now public debt levels are the highest in, in history. But also, I would argue, monetary policy, um, which was very effective in picking up the pieces when things broke, in a way too effectively in some respects, given that it would encourage the repeated use uh, in that context. But little to constrain the, the buildup of financial imbalances. So partly as a result, and this is only one of the reasons, of course, we have seen interest rates, nominal and real, that have never been as low as they have been in history. And partly as a result, again, this is only one reason, we have seen uh, private debt levels uh, which have reached historical highs. Now, the implication of all this is that uh, financial instability has not been addressed particularly effectively, that more holistic macrofinancial stability frameworks in which also fiscal and monetary policy would, would play a role have not been yet put in place. And that if something goes wrong, of course, central banks will be, will be blamed. Now, this brings me to the second, which is a related instance of what I would call exaggerated expectations. And that is the view that central banks could fine-tune inflation as it drifted stubbornly below target, in some cases, they left uh, less than half a percentage point. When inflation had arguably reached what Volcker and then Greenspan would define as price stability, that is a situation, a condition in which inflation does not affect the behavior of economic agents. Now, I think the problem here is that I'm not sure the public ever understood uh, ever understood the reasons for, for this, but because the public likes price stability and dislikes inflation. And this has created a certain tension that it is rather difficult to manage. And now, of course, we know that exceptionally low real interest rates and nominal interest rates are complicating the task uh, of dealing with this unexpected, I would say, at least to, even to me, uh, increasing inflationary pressures. And this brings me to the third instance, which is uh, the broadening of policy considerations in the pursuit of uh, central bank objectives. And this is something that uh, Harold also mentioned. Either as a result of formal changes in, in the mandates, for example, the addition of uh, employment, uh, or indeed of less formal extensions and, and interpretations of the mandates in which distributional considerations have become more important, even environmental ones. And of course, this broadening reflects political and social priorities, and therefore pressures on, on the central banks as part of, of this broader government. But again, I think my concern is that this raises the risk of disappointment 
again complicating the task of central banks. In this context, recently the fight against inflation, because that will inevitably require unpopular decisions, which might be seen in contrast with, with those objectives. So let me conclude again by reiterating the point which um, I think there is a need to try and narrow this expectations gap between what central banks can achieve, can deliver, and what they are expected to deliver. Now this is a very tricky issue, it's, it's very difficult, and depending on how we approach the question, your view about how the economy works, you may come up with different answers to, to that. Uh, you may wish to have a very narrow uh, a role for banking and uh, in a way, uh, Harold, you mentioned payments and settlement systems, which is really the very, very core of central banking functions. If you go back in history, even before debt management, that was the key reason for, for the creation of central banks. But personally, I, I would focus on more generally on monetary and, and financial stability as being the core aspects of central banking through through history, in addition to, to the payments. You can think that the payments as being a precondition for these sanctions. But I think that has to be flanked by two important uh, additional aspects, regardless of what you think the, the role of the central bank should, should be. And one is a key recognition of what central banks can do on their own, uh, be that with respect to financial stability, price stability, or macro stability more generally. And consistent with that, I would say clear communication so as to manage both policymakers uh, as well as the public's expectations. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio, for reminding us about the uh, expectations gap, what central banks are supposed to, are uh, expected to provide and what they really can provide. Um, now we move to Lucrezia. Lucrezia, the floor is yours. society to function effectively. So this is about norms. Douglas North would have said it's about the rules of the game, formal and informal institutions which are in age of trust. Therefore, it seems to me that the role of central banks in contributing to social capital must be linked to the trust that citizens have in them. And I think that was also the line that Harold took uh, this morning. But this trust must be related to their ability to deliver and to their credibility. So that's my first point. Now, going beyond that, uh, one has to reflect to the fact that central banks are part of government. And uh, therefore, their credibility is intimately related to the credibility of the government as a whole. And this, in turn, depends on the overall government capacity of implementing policy which are effective and perceived as fair. And know that it's uh, not only effectiveness that matters, but also the perception of fairness. And both the stability of the currency and the safety of government debt uh, depend on that. The stability of the currency is linked to the credibility of the issuer, as we all know, in a fiat money system, that all we need. Likewise, the safety premium enjoyed by credible governments uh, allow financing debt at a real rate, which can be below the real growth of the economy, even for a long time, uh, as we have uh, experienced in the last decades. So in both cases, credibility allows government to enjoy seniorage as a special privilege. And I think it's very important to relay central banks in this uh, you know, discussion of uh, under what circumstances government as a whole can keep this privilege. And I think it's quite clear from history that uh, uh, you know, this is very important for both the credibility of government and, uh, and central banking. Now, 
the Eurozone, and here we are in Lisbon, so it is unavoidable for me to talk about the Eurozone as a special case. Uh, um, this is a tricky, is a tricky goal, is a tricky target. Uh, we have one monetary authority, 19 fiscal jurisdictions, so to have that kind of congruence between government and central bank policy, it's a difficult goal to achieve. Uh, so, and, and the relationship between central banks and government uh, is a very complex one. But this observation, uh, the previous observation, remains fundamentally true. So the implication is that the role of the ECB in building social capital cannot be disjoint from the ability of the fiscal authorities and the monetary authority to deliver collectively. And this will be my second point. Uh, now, this is not easy, as we have experienced in multiple crises. Atanasio already talked about the difference uh, of how we collectively dealt uh, with the debt crisis and how we dealt uh, with the COVID crisis. Uh, it is clear that during the debt crisis, the monetary fiscal authorities have been engaged in a game of chicken, the central bank being the only game in town, etc. Clearly, in the EU, we are in a very fragile arrangement. <coughs> True, we did better with COVID. Um, why? Well, first of all, I think a key thing was an implicit coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, which we lacked in the debt, uh, during the debt crisis. I mean, I would define that coordination, uh, I mean, not at the risk uh, of uh, saying something politically incorrect, uh, as managed monetization. Okay, so that is massive fiscal expansion supported by ECB purchases. So uh, in that occasion, the ECB has acted uh, at the same time to pursue monetary policy objective, but also financial stability objective uh, with several instruments. So, you know, the world in which the central bank has just one instrument is long gone. And, um, you know, we had both QE for monetary policy purposes, but also QE for falling into the cracks to talk, you know, to provide liquidity in those segments of the markets which had become dysfunctional. So as a, as a result, in that occasion, the, you know, the ECB credibility was boosted, the social trust was kind of protected and so on. But can we be sure that this will work next time or should we actually rethink you know, the pillars of the governance of the EU uh, so that we can make sure that uh, the next crisis, and we are already in the next crisis, uh, this kind of coordination, this kind of backing from uh, you know, government to central banks uh, are going to be insured. Um, so this is, I think, is the key questions when we think about the role of the ECB in rebuilding social capital and, and in protecting social capital going forward. So that's my, my, uh, my point three. Um, evidence suggests that in order to be effective, both fiscal and monetary authorities um, had to stretch existing rules uh, as defined by a narrow interpretation of the Maastricht Treaty. treaty. And, uh, you know, this was the right thing to do, but uh, this is uh, pushing it in a very fragile equilibrium. So it, things may go wrong because, uh, you know, this creates conflicts. The rules are not that clear anymore. So the question is really how stretch are those rules? And uh, do we need to reinterpret in them? And, uh, you know, there are important parts of the treaty that need clarification, or do we need a radical change? Okay, so I think the question is open. Uh, but we cannot put that question and keep it under the carpet any longer. Where do we come from? Uh, you know, if we take the uh, historical experience, uh, and uh, actually Harold uh, talked about it uh, earlier, after the experience of the great inflation of the 70s, central banks uh, regained the lost credibility by embracing inflation targeting and narrow central banking. Associated with that, uh, the, the best practice became uh, to grant them operational and sometimes, as in the case of the ECB, financial independence. And the ECB, uh, the design of the ECB is the child of that consensus. Now, after 15 years of multiple crises, uh, uh, this has been challenged. I think there is no doubt uh, that that concept is not fit for purpose anymore. 
Central banks remain to become broader. Monetary and fiscal interaction become more visible. Distribution of consequences of monetary policy as well as financial stability implications have become a source of concern. And today, central banks indeed are called to do many things, okay? Financing government directly or indirectly, act as market <laughs> makers, pursue green asset purchases, um, and to consider issuing digital currency, thereby potentially acquiring direct control of credit allocation. So they are now doing this uh, on a routine basis uh, and with multiple is instruments. So the question again, the question I, I asked before, you know, it's, it has to be there, okay? So can, is this, you know, do we have the framework to, you know, support this broader remit of the central banks? Of course, discussing this goes beyond, uh, uh, you know, the, the specific uh, uh, questions of this panel. Um, and, but, you know, the point that really I want to forcefully make is that the central banks do not act in a vacuum. So in reflecting their role, we should reflect about the governance uh, issues as a whole. I want to mention a uh, few directions of reflection, three uh, directions of reflections, uh, uh, which uh, uh, I think are important uh, to put on the table in the central bank community. Since I just have one minute, I will just outline and then maybe I, I will come back to that uh, uh, in the discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to develop a framework for management, managing central bank risk, okay? So the moment in which, uh, uh, you know, uh, the balance sheet is increasing, the instruments are broader, and so on. That framework uh, is, is very important to, 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 to be developed. Uh, and I would say that the rules under which the ECB are, are ambiguous uh, at, at the least, okay, so that they have to be, that we need more clarity to, uh, to protect what we want to protect. And, you know, I will return that on the debate. Uh, if there is another occasion. The second thing that we need to do is to develop a framework uh, to facilitate monetary and fiscal coordination. I mean, this uh, concept of independence in which there is an absolute Chinese wall between the fiscal and monetary authority is not fit for purpose anymore. And, uh, and the last thing uh, is that we need to develop a better framework with the, to deal with, with multiple objectives. Uh, and uh, here there is the issue of macroprudential, but not only that. I think uh, there is uh, in the interpretation of uh, this kind of new inflexible inflation targeting framework, uh, we need uh, you know, to, to have a stories on how to deal with secondary objectives uh, and perhaps uh, relating uh, you know, the cost in terms of secondary objectives, the cost of the instruments to the horizon uh, at which we are aiming at reaching uh, the inflation target. Now, uh, this is, I think, is very relevant today. This will be my last word. Uh, uh, there are new risks looming uh, with the Ukrainian war, uh, and this framework, the framework will be tested again. Uh, the emphasis here is financial stability, but actually the new issue will be how to deal uh, with stagflationary type of shocks. Uh, and all the things that I've said are relevant for these particular issues. First of all, secondary objective, how do we deal with the out, uh, out inflation output employment trade-off? Uh, second, uh, how do we coordinate with fiscal policy? This is like a, is a supply shock, and in that sense it's a very different story than the US stories in my view. So we need the fiscal to get into the cracks and we need that kind of coordination. And also, uh, there will be an issue of uh, ballooning uh, government debt. And uh, you know, the central bank will be called to do some kind of form of government financing. So in that sense, uh, the provisions of the treaty no bailout, no monetary financing, proportionality, they need to be interpreted with more clarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucrezia. Um, uh, it's good to remember that uh, the contribution to social capital is conditional on other policies or governance issues, and that uh, is very important, having in mind as well the expectations gap that uh, Claudio mentioned. So, Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro, uh, and thank you, Mario, for the, for the invitation. Uh, and congratulations, uh, by the way, to all the staff of, uh, of the Banco de Portugal for this uh, commemoration. Um, I have to think, uh, I have to say that um, for me, the, the Banco de Portugal has a, a good, uh, very good reputation among central banks. Uh, 
So I think it's uh, probably a good start to, to rebuild the social capital uh, here in, in, in Portugal. So congratulations also to the staff for, for this. Um, as Lucrecia, the, um, the topic of the, of the conference, the role of central banks in rebuilding social capital, is, is, is a rather complex uh, question. Uh, so I, I will try to, to simplify it uh, a bit, uh, probably even uh, too much, uh, and I will uh, try to approach uh, um, the topic uh, from one angle, um, which is uh, basically related to, to the motivation of the specific uh, institutional setting that we central banks or supervisors in general uh, have as compared to, to other uh, public uh, authorities, which is basically independence okay, or autonomy, as, uh, as you prefer, Claudio, to, to, to name it. I think it's interesting to, to come back to, to the origin, to the motivation of why we want central banks to, or, or supervisors to be independent. And uh, I guess that this is based on the evidence that we have uh, on the determinants of uh, long-term growth that points to the fact that the quality of institutions is important. Okay? Uh, and in particular, I think the quality, a good quality, uh, is, 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 um, is important uh, in particular to incorporate long-term considerations into the decision making. Okay? I guess this is, the, for me, the most relevant argument in order to justify the, the independence. So basically, independence uh, allow us, or should allow us, to incorporate into our decision making uh, elements that are relevant for the, the welfare of citizens uh, in the long run that it is much more difficult to incorporate for, for politicians, uh, basically because, uh, of course, they, they incorporate the, 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 the political cycle. Okay? But then, if, if this is the case, um, then the legitimacy of central banks is basically a, an utilitarian one, in, in the sense that we think that central banks uh, should be uh, independent because with this independence, we will be in a position to deliver in a better way than other public institutions that are not uh, independent. Okay? Um, the key for me uh, is how we, can we invest in this legitimacy in a, in a, in a, in a, better, in a better way. And, and probably uh, the, the best way to do so, at least in my opinion, is to connect this uh, need for, the, for delivering in our mandates with the controls, the transparency, um, the, the accountability uh, elements, okay, that are always needed no? uh, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to go hand, hand in hand with independence. And one thing that probably we haven't done enough, um, and I will give an example on, uh, which is the one that this, the Basel Committee is doing, uh, and it's, by the way, it was not my decision, it was a decision that was taken many years uh, ago, uh, which is to put a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, weight on evaluation, on evaluating okay, our, uh, our own capacity to, to deliver. By the way, this is uh, something that I think central banks do very often uh, to emphasize the need for evaluation of other public authorities. But it is not always the case that we do it with our own uh, mandate. Okay? Uh, and of course, uh, we have to, to take into account that uh, evaluation is difficult, to, to build, uh, to construct the counterfactual is very complex. Um, and of course, social science, uh, social science as, as uh, uh, economics uh, is not always ready no, to, to give a, a, a definite answer. But this is why I think central banks should, in parallel, to incorporate this evaluation into uh, in our, uh, uh, its own decision making, invest in research, which is something that we've done uh, traditionally. And there is an additional element that I think is important, which is, of course, that we know that citizens very often do not understand what we are doing. It will be also very difficult for them to understand the results of our evaluation. And this is why I think also central banks, uh, supervisors, etc., should also invest on financial literacy, on financial education. And this is something that we are doing uh, more, more, and, more and more. So let me focus uh, just for, for a few minutes on, on what the Basel uh, Committee is doing. You know that the Basel Committee is, uh, is the global uh, standard setter for the prudential regulation of banks, and our main objective is uh, basically to enhance uh, global financial uh, stability. Well, um, when um, I was appointed chair of the, of the Basel Committee uh, three years ago, uh, I was very positively surprised that the Basel Committee has a, a permanent evaluation program of its own activities. Okay? 
Uh, and in fact, now we have like two branches of this, uh, of this evaluation that are running. The first one is basically on whether the, all the, the regulatory reform agenda that was approved after the global financial crisis is, is working. Okay? And then second, this is a decision that we took uh, uh, in 2020, is basically to, to see whether the, the test, the, the stress test that was the COVID crisis uh, was uh, also um, um, teaching us something in terms of whether the standards that we had approved uh, were working as, as intended. So let me uh, give you some, some results of uh, well, the preliminary assessment uh, of this evaluation. We already published um, a, prelim a preliminary uh, uh, report uh, last year. We are in the, now in, in the process of updating this, this report and uh, most likely during, during the summer or at the end of the year we will be ready to, 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 to give uh, more, more uh, I, I would say, more, more, more definite, uh, uh, definitive results. But there are, I think there are uh, uh, results uh, that are already there in the paper that was published last year that are, 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 are interesting. So first, we know, and it, it was uh, explicitly um, um, evidence uh, in, the, in the paper, that uh, the reforms at least provided uh, for a financial system that was more resilient at the, at the beginning of the, of the financial crisis. Okay? So banks were better capitalized, banks were better funded. Um, and by the way, it was also important that it was done globally. So it's not, uh, it was not done only by all, some jurisdictions as compared to others, but globally, this was, uh, banks were uh, more, more resilient. Uh, and, and, and factually, it's also true that banks uh, have continued to lend to households and businesses during, the, during, the, during this crisis, during the COVID crisis, which is a, is a very important difference as compared to what ha happened in the previous, in the previous uh, crisis. And even today, if you look at the, at the ratios of uh, solvency and liquidity of banks, they are still much, uh, much, very high and, and much higher even than before the global uh, financial uh, crisis. Um, of course, disentangling whether the effects of the, um, or this, this, this increase in resilience was uh, basically the, the consequences of, uh, of our reforms or was the consequences of the fact that during this crisis, as Atanasios was emphasizing, monetary and fiscal policy uh, was very active. Okay? There was an extraordinary support to households and, 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 and firms. Uh, is very, very difficult, but it is done, or it is uh, at least uh, uh, intended to, 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 do, uh, to, do, to be done in this, in this paper. And uh, mm, the evidence, uh, the pieces of evidence that uh, are shown there stress the importance precisely of, of, of the financial reform. And the, the, let me give you some, some results that for me are, are relevant. So we, f we find that banks with higher capital ratios suffer less in terms of, uh, uh, for example, of uh, uh, increases in CDS spreads. We also find that uh, strongly capitalized banks showed greater increases in lending than other banks. And a third interesting result is that even banks with higher capital were also in a position, in a better position uh, to, uh, to support the measures that were taken by governments. So the uptake of the public support measures was higher precisely in those banks that uh, had uh, higher capital ratios. The interesting thing of the um, of this evaluation is, of course, that at the same time, we are already seeing that there might be um, some lessons learned. So we are al already highlighting that there might be some pieces of, of the regulatory reform that might be not working as, as intended. And let me focus on one uh, issue on which uh, Claudio has also worked uh, deeply uh, during the last uh, years, which is to what extent uh, capital and liquidity buffers are usable. As, as ambitions. Okay? So, so we wanted banks to have uh, higher levels of capital precisely to be used in a situation of crisis. So if in the end we observe that this capital is not being used, uh, there, is, uh, there is a problem. Okay? And we might need to, to modify some, uh, some things in the, in the legislation. So well, the evidence suggests that banks uh, may have been hesitant to use the regulatory capital buffers had it been deemed necessary in practice. Okay? And, um, well, the, the empirical evidence that uh, uh, is, uh, has been produced by the committee indicates that, in fact, banks with less capital headroom, and here the, 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 the key word is headroom, uh, tended to lend less during the, during the pandemic. There was also a relatively larger decline in average uh, risk weights uh, at banks uh, with less capital headrooms, perhaps with, the, with an attempt to defend uh, capital, uh, capital ratios. 
And importantly, uh, also, the buffer threshold appears to have been the constraint forcing banks to, to adjust their behavior, as lower capital ratios alone did not drive the, the results. Um, and, uh, and finally, an interesting result uh, also is not, it was that the, the issue was not only about, only about quantity, but also about prices. So banks' proximity to buffers also appears to have affected the cost of, of lending. Okay. So what are the reasons behind this, um, this problem um, are unclear, whether this is, uh, well, that the banks were uh, basically, the, the level of uncertainty was very high and they were basically projecting that there might be losses in the future and they, they wanted to keep these buffers in order to be used to cover those losses, that's one possibility. The lack of formal guidance by supervisors to, on, the, on the rebuilding of these buffers, that might be another, another issue. Um, low profitability, that, uh, that can be also an argument behind this result, or market stigma. Uh, we are now in the process of trying to understand precisely this, uh, the, the origin of, of this. A closely uh, related and very important issue uh, is the one of releasable buffers. So you know that in the, in the framework, in the Basel framework, there are some buffers, in particular the counter-cyclical buffer, that, uh, well, the intention is to be activated in, 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 in the booming period, precisely in order to make banks more resilient and to deactivate these buffers uh, during, during, the, during recessions. Um, so here, the analysis of the, of the Basel Committee suggests that the release of such buffers had a positive effect on, on lending during the, during the pandemic. And the, the results, uh, for example, for, specifically for the euro area, which is where we had uh, more micro data, suggest that banks adjust their internal capital targets cyclically. So banks, when they are in a, in a, in a booming period, um, basically they, they reduce their own internal capital targets and they do the opposite uh, when, when we are in, in recession. So the evidence also points to the fact that uh, authorities, macroprudential authorities, have the, the capacity to, to move these internal uh, capital targets okay, by releasing or, 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 or activating the, the, the CCYB. Um, and this is why, precisely, uh, the evidence is pointing to the fact that the release of the capital buffer uh, generated a reduction also in the internal capital uh, targets of, of, of banks, and this allowed in the, in the, in the, um, in the final stage to, to provide more credit to, to the economy. So I, I would say that for me, I mean, if I combined all this information, probably the only thing that it is clear to me now, um, which I think we need to, 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 to think more about, about it uh, in, in, the next, uh, in the next phase, which is that we need to consider whether there is sufficient releasable capital in the system. Okay? Uh, and let me put two, two examples, uh, two very concrete examples on why I think uh, this is necessary. So the, the, the good example is uh, the, the COVID crisis. So in many jurisdictions, um, I think it was also the case in Portugal, by the way, you were observing the emergence of systemic uh, risk okay, in, in, in the economy. And this is why many, many public uh, situation on which, I mean, the systemic risk, uh, risk is there because, for example, housing, uh, housing uh, dynamics are, are very exuberant in, in many jurisdictions, but the, 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 the capital might not be there. Okay. Um, and of course, the opposite is also true. There, there were other countries, for example, Spain, on which we were not, we were not observing an increase in systemic risk before the COVID crisis. So the, the CCYB had not been activated. So at the, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, we didn't have any capacity, any room for maneuver to deactivate uh, the CCYB because it had not been uh, activated uh, previously. So, um, I mean, the conclusion that we might uh, need to work on uh, increasing releasable uh, capital, and there might be different options to do so, is an important, is an important, an important one. Well, I have other comments, uh, Pedro, but uh, in the interest of time, I might... Uh, Thank you very much, Pablo, for yeah, bringing um, the financial stability again for the debate as an important element of social capital and the idea of assessment uh, of our own measures uh, for an accountability purpose. Now, we'll, I will run now a short uh, round of questions to the panel, and after that I will open to the public. So please uh, prepare your questions. Um, I will start, I will join questions in 
two, so I'll start by Lucrecia and Athanasius, by that order, if you don't mind. You have just expressed your views on the recent strategy review of the ECB. Uh, you, Lucrecia, in the CPR report, and uh, you, Athanasius, on the report for the Econfin, <coughs> where you express your views on the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. Today, <coughs> I'd like to expand a bit uh, this to the interactions between uh, monetary and, fees and, 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 and financial stability, if you want monetary and financial iterations conditional on fiscal. And um, as Claudio just remembers, business cycles and financial cycles do not uh, coincide. So in your views, how should monetary policy incorporate financial stability considerations, in particular in a situation in which, in spite of all the progress on macroprudential, uh, macroprudential uh, is still um, uh, incomplete. Uh, probably, <coughs> Lucas will bring more views to Europe and the Athanasius for the US. Uh, someone said that uh, public debts are very high, and in particular in the US, which I think reached 125%. So, Lucrezia. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, just uh, before that, uh, for two minutes, three minutes, and yeah, just yeah. to leave uh, <laughs> time for the panel. Of course, you can choose whatever to say in those minutes. No, no, okay. So, well, I mean, the obvious answer, the standard answer that uh, is, uh, okay, you have monetary policy objective and then you have financial stability objective, so you need uh, another instrument, and macroprudential is, is that instrument. Uh, maybe we don't know enough about how that works. Uh, I mean, I've, he I've heard different things. Uh, clearly, to me, the answer to that question is, uh, and in line with what I said before, uh, I mean, the answer will have to be in the policy mix, okay? So that they will have to be about uh, bank capital, it will have to be about uh, also the development uh, of capital market, it will have to be, and all these have fiscal implications. So again, this goes very much in line on the fact that the central banks uh, do not uh, operate in a vacuum, uh, and so we, we, we have more than one instrument, uh, and therefore, um, I think that should be possible to reconcile, you know, to, to pursue more than, uh, than one objective. A different discussion, uh, uh, it is, um, you know, if, uh, if you have more than one instrument and you have the primary instrument, which is price stability, uh, how do you, uh, you know, how do you consider the cost of pursuing uh, a secondary objective uh, when, the, when, there is, when the instruments are costly. And now, indeed, in the, in the CPR report, uh, we have a discussion about that, and then uh, uh, we sketch the general idea linking the cost uh, in terms of secondary objective to the horizon of the price stability objective. So the policy instruments that achieve price stability can have cost uh, or benefits in terms of secondary objectives. If there are costs, uh, that would justify a longer horizon for the price stability objective is there are benefits, a shorter horizon. This may be relevant today, where actually more than financial stability were worrying about uh, you know, the employment inflation trade-off, uh, which would suggest, according to this logic, uh, you know, a longer horizon to reach the price stability objective. So more flexibility in tolerating inflation above target. Okay, that's a very good message. So, Athanasius. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So let me, let me start by saying that, uh, of course, uh, central banking is about stability, and this is starting with price stability, and then after that, financial stability and economic stability, they, they go together. As Lucrecia pointed out, we do have multiple tools. The question is whether we activate those tools uh, in, in the best way to achieve uh, all of the mandates uh, uh, simultaneously. And uh, I have to say, uh, uh, if I compare the United States with, uh, with the euro area, uh, since you invited me to, to do that, I'm going to say that in the euro area, um, we have better tools for macroprudential uh, regulation than in the United States. So in that sense, uh, the euro area is in better place to advance uh, both monetary policy objectives and financial stability objectives. Uh, one recommendation I would make, uh, is, since we are uh, also in the mode of, in, of, of suggesting improvements, uh, in my view, the, the ESRB that was set up, uh, I recall, when I was on, uh, early on, uh, when it was created, uh, it was set up before the uh, 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 ECB actually became the supervisor through the SSM of the banking system. 
in my view, uh, it would be useful in the context of the, uh, of the euro area in particular to revisit the, the authority the ESRB has to uh, implement macroprudential policies in the euro area as a whole and to make, uh, make uh, suggestions that uh, would need to be implemented unless uh, there is an explanation to the contrary by member states as well. That's not the case. So the ESRB right now is there as, as an institution, but it does not have the authority that I think would be best suited to promote uh, macro prudential policy, financial stability in the, in, in, in the euro area on top of uh, uh, what the ECB is delivering with respect to price stability. Now, to your question, um, and this is, this is uh, touching upon uh, 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 Claudio's uh, 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 question and, and, and reasoning as well, uh, is monetary policy, interest rate policy, uh, a first tool to go to for promoting financial stability? Uh, my answer to that is definitely no. The first tool would be macroprudential tools, and we can make much better use of those than we have been making in the past, and I think we can improve the legislation. But there is a, is that we actually are quite uncertain that the history of, of uh, trying to improve financial stability uh, using monetary policy tools and having monetary policy deviate from delivering price stability and growth actually is, is a mixed bag. Uh, uh, quite often we have episodes where central banks did a lot of damage to the economy and did not improve financial stability by trying to use monetary policy instruments uh, thinking that they would uh, improve financial stability. So I think uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a rule of thumb, uh, it's best for central banks, like for the ECB, focus first and foremost on price stability. This one, I, I agree with, with all who make this point, first and foremost price stability. But then subject to that, the second element I would have is, is do what it can in order to enhance financial stability without compromising price stability. And there is a lot of improvement that, uh, that can be done on the part of the ECB so that ECB policies are not themselves inviting financial instability uh, in the euro area. And I gave you an example, and there are other examples as well. I think this is where the emphasis should be uh, for addressing this question. Yeah, thank you very much for a very clear answer. Now I move to Pablo and to Claudio <clears throat> by this order. Um, financial reforms were decisive to rebuild social capital. So what is really missing in the macroprudential framework? And how do we see the delay, for instance, in the Basel III finalization? That is what I would like, I will ask to, to, to Pablo. And for you, Claudio, of course, we know that um, crises come from very high levels of debt. How do you see uh, corporate debt, I mean, in, in Europe or in the world in general? Um, <clears throat> having in mind, for instance, that uh, just uh, two days ago, uh, Andre Henri uh, and Sam Wood, the deputy governor of the Bank of England, wrote a letter um, saying that there was excessive risk taking in the leverage market. So I'll start by you, Pablo, and then I will go for the audience. Yeah. Well, on the macro, on the macroprudential framework, um, I mean, a quick answer uh, will be for me. I mean, we are precisely in, in, in Europe. We are in the process of revising the macroprudential framework no, that uh, that was incorporated into legislation. At, uh, and at least from, uh, for me, in, in the discussion that we have had precisely on, on the ESRB that Atanasios uh, was, was mentioning, there are at least uh, for me three, three lessons uh, that might require uh, changes no, in, the, in the legislation. The first one is uh, to incorporate borrower-based measures, so not only capital instruments. Um, I think uh, the, precisely in Portugal, you were very active no, in, in, with these instruments, and I think it's, uh, the, 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 the evidence that we have is that they can be very useful in order to complement uh, capital-based uh, measures. Um, the second is the, precisely the, 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 the comment that was made in, in my initial intervention, the, the fact that we need more releasable uh, capital. And the third, that we uh, might also need uh, some macroprudential instruments for uh, the non-banking uh, sector. Okay, that, that would be my quick uh, answer. Okay. Because, of course, we know that uh, this is, uh, the, the importance of the non-banking sector is, is increasing by the day. There are some risks uh, that, are, uh, that, that are related to, 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 to this uh, development of the non-banking sector, so we need also instruments to, to be activated uh, in case of um, exuberance. And then on 
on Basel 3, well, you know um, that uh, Basel 3 implementation is, uh, I mean, by G20 leaders, by us supervisors, we are emphasizing the need for full, uh, timely uh, implementation. The fact is uh, that there, there are delays uh, already, uh, including here in Europe, uh, but also in other uh, jurisdictions. Um, it is interesting to, to also mention that the, the Basel Committee is also working in this case on providing some evidence. Here, not, it's, it's not empirical evidence. There has not been implementation. It's impossible to provide uh, um, evidence on, on the effects of, of, of this Basel III, but it's model-based uh, evidence that uh, I think the, interest, the, the results are very interesting in the sense that uh, they provide a base to justify a full implementation uh, and a, a timely implementation because with these models uh, we, we know or at least we anticipate that the, the impact on growth in the long-term growth of, of, of our economies will be very, very significant in terms of uh, precisely through the, the, the higher resilience that they may uh, provide for, for, our, for our banks. And interesting enough is also that uh, we, with these models, we also know that if there is a, a dilution of the, of, of, the, of the agreement, these benefits are much lower or, or even uh, they disappear. Uh, so I hope that uh, this evidence that has been provided, in particular by the European Central Bank, by the way, there was a very nice paper uh, that was published uh, two, two years ago, is also a, a, an element that uh, helped uh, legislators to, to go into, into this direction. Thank you. Claudio? And then we open the floor. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that, 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 uh, an act of humility here. Um, I guess many of you know this uh, saying uh, by Yogi Berra that it's, uh, it's very tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And um, at the BIS, we got clearly one prediction wrong. We thought that um, the, uh, the COVID crisis would first of all have a liquidity uh, element to it, or liquidity crisis, and then it would morph into more of a solvency or bankruptcy crisis um, as a result of the great reallocation and so on. In fact, we, we got it wrong, and so we've been sort of looking back and, and understand why. One reason was the fact that um, there was a lot of pent-up demand that came up very quickly. And the other, of course, was the policy response, which was a huge policy response, concerted policy response, because on the fiscal side, on the monetary policy side, and indeed on the, uh, on the regulatory side with, with a strong macro prudential perspective. Um, this meant that the economy actually did quite well. And going back to what I, say, uh, what I was saying before, it meant that the, the financial cycle and uh, the vulnerabilities, however, that were there continue to build up. And the, what's happening to house prices around the world is a typical example. The other thing is, as you mentioned, and as I mentioned in my previous intervention, is that the levels of debt globally, not just public debt, but private debt, are at historical highs. And that also applies to corporate debt. So the question going forward is what might happen. Now, I'm not going to make any predictions, but I will definitely say that, the, uh, that there are significant risks that have been building up. Um, there has been a lot of aggressive risk-taking in the corporate sector uh, linked to very, very low interest rates. Uh, and that has continued despite the, the COVID crisis and even despite the, the crisis in the Ukraine. Uh, if you look at corporate spreads, they're quite narrow by, by historical standards. And this is what uh, has uh, basically led um, the supervisory authorities, Andrea and Ria, and also the, the Bank of England, to highlight the need to have a more cautious uh, response. Now, the good news, is, as, uh, as, Pablo, um, uh, as Pablo also mentioned, is that a lot has been done to improve the, uh, the capitalization of the banks. So they're better off than they would otherwise be. Uh, the piece of less good news is that very little has been done for the non-bank sector, capital markets in general, and we saw what happened in, in March in, uh, 2020. Now, part of this was intended, shifting the risk outside the banking sector, but what has happened is that regulation in that sector has been lagging behind. So bottom line, um, let's not let our, uh, our guard down. There are risks. They have been building up. 
uh, and uh, it will be important to try to deal with them as effectively as possible. Great. My question wasn't for a prediction, but for assessment <laughs> of risks, which actually we have done very clearly. Um, so, questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we will collect them in one round. There is already one. Um, so, two. I mean, we are <clears throat> three. So, there are three interventions. Um, we, we are s somewhat short of time. So, Vitor Constancio first. Uh, and then there are two more interventions. We'll limit this round for these three questions. Yes, I had questions for... Please, please identify the addressee if, um, if there I, is a specific that's one. That's what I was going to yeah, do. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, my questions are to Lucrezia and to Claudio. Um, to, to Lucrezia, um, the first question is, uh, everything that you said in this context led me to the interpretation that you consider that the uh, objectives of, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the ECB as defined in the treaty are too narrow. Uh, nowadays, as you know, um, in the economies and the financial uh, systems have evolved and uh, other considerations are, are needed. So uh, if uh, my interpretation uh, is uh, correct, then I wanted to give you the opportunity to address two of the three points with which you ended your intervention, um, in particular in what regards the terms of cooperation of monetary and uh, fiscal policy that you said uh, the situation has changed and that sort of cooperation is needed, in what terms and what would have to be changed to uh, make that possible. And uh, regarding the uh, question of the secondary objectives uh, that you also uh, mentioned that it was necessary to clarify, uh, do you mean that it would be any, uh, in any way helpful that these secondary objectives, which are indeed everything that is good, uh, uh, if it would help to have a sort of uh, uh, prioritizing of those secondary uh, objectives, or you were thinking about something else. To, to Claudio very uh, briefly, you mentioned the expectations gap, which is a reality, uh, but the, the gap m may come from the expectations being uh, sometimes too uh, wild and not related uh, with the, the exact functions of central banks, or if the gap comes also from the fact that the central banks have difficulties in delivering their own core uh, objectives uh, in uh, uh, today. Uh, and that, if that is a reflection of the state of monetary theory, which uh, continues to say, uh, coming from the new Keynesian models, that uh, you move interest rates, short or medium term, with QE, and uh, you know all equilibria come uh, intertemporal, everything because the response of consumption and investment is uh, very effective to those moves of interest rates. Do you believe that, or do you think that the gap comes only from the expectation side? Thank you very much. Let us collect the other two questions, please. I will ask for a one-minute question, please. No, no. Okay, very, very briefly. Um, it's, it's a different topic. It was mentioned by by Professor Harold that there is obviously an increasing non-regulated sector and the regulated sector is a dual world. So uh, basically, this dual world, we have a very strongly regulated, very strongly supervised. And at the same time, we have a larger, non-regulated one. This is, it was also mentioned, if I understood, I agree, that if there is a crisis, probably will come from the non-regulated. If there is a crisis on this non-regulated, probably not only capital will be lost, but social capital will be lost, and a little bit of less trust on the uh, uh, central banks and the legislators that have done a very good job in the last years. At least the central banks have, have done a very good job. So this issue is not of concern to have a more balanced world, 
and uh, uh, with less risk for the future of social capital destruction? Thank you very much. Third question. Good uh, morning. My name is Ignacio Alvarez Rendueles, and I am uh, working at one of the Portuguese banks. And uh, in connection with the comments of uh, Governor Nanez de Cos, uh, where he mentioned uh, the uh, insufficient evaluation and, and uh, knowledge among the general public of, the, of, of what central banks do, uh, I would like to ask him in particular as head of the uh, BIS and with uh, understanding of the, the several jurisdictions, um, if there is any particular jurisdiction where that uh, shortcoming is, is, is less so and is a, is a model, and I would like to go one step behind, beyond and say that apart from the general public, uh, whether there is any, any jurisdiction where uh, a central bank or the supervisory authority benefits from, uh, let's say, a feedback survey from the supervised uh, entities, which I think we live in a world where every time we do anything, we get back a call and we are asked you know, about the interaction no? uh, in a constructive way, ov obviously. You know? So I wanted to ask if there is any, any market where that trend, which is more applicable to the private sector, is, is also happening in the, in, the, in the world of the supervi supervised uh, uh, banks. No? Okay, thank you very much. So just the last question for Nuno Fernandes. Nuno, you have to be brief, right? I'll be very brief. Uh, my question is for, for Pablo, uh, which is uh, very much enjoyed your, your analysis of the, how to sustain the independence of central banks and the need to, to reinforce the evaluation and the controls to guarantee that, that same independence. And uh, so that's related to the governance of central banks. And my question here is really, how did you guarantee the independence of the evaluation that you shared with us? Terrific, thank you very much. So <clears throat> we'll go uh, by the four panelists and we'll start by uh, Lucrecia, possibly, and then Claudia, there was a specific question for them, then Pablo as well, and then Natanazio, you will conclude from Boston. I will just ask two minutes if possible each because we are already getting in panel two time. Yeah. Uh, That's not good for social capital. <laughs> So, Vitor, thank uh, for the question. So, uh, what I really meant uh, is, uh, you know, I use this term, uh, narrow central banking. By narrow central banking, I mean, uh, you know, the kind of inflation targeting, you know, number one, phase number one conception. So, now we are in a very different context, especially because we have large balance sheets and, uh, uh, and we have multiple instruments, okay? so. Multiple objectives uh, uh, comes with it in many ways because in many occasions in the last 15 years, uh, central banks have been involved in monetary policy and financial stability. And most of the time, actually, those two, those two things have been uh, uh, you know, completely in the same line. Okay? Defending the financial system has also been uh, uh, you know, congruent with, uh, with defending uh, price stability. Now, um, there is a discussion, is uh, why are we going to go back uh, to narrow central banking in that sense or not? My view is that we will not, and uh, we will not for many reasons. Uh, first of all, because what we have learned is that uh, financial uh, markets are very fragile and that uh, frictions are much more pervasive than we thought, and therefore intervention uh, with these new instruments uh, to you know, attack the spreads, control the entire yield curve, and so on. So all the new things that central banks are doing are actually quite effective. Uh, we can discuss how much effective they are in a macro sense. Definitely, they are effective in uh, preserving the stability of the financial system. So that's. Uh, so, okay, but if we believe in that, and also, I mean, these things are there to stay because there is a huge demand for safety and that uh, which, uh, you know, and which I think also will, uh, will continue to be pervasive. So, but if we believe that, okay, then there is a question of how we manage the balance sheet risk. Uh, 
the risk of a large balance sheet uh, in the central banks uh, and uh, you know the volatility of, of the net income that uh, we will will come will come with that and so then I think that the issue of go, uh, central bank capital is very important and not discussed especially in the euro area because uh, it's damn difficult to discuss it because that opens the questions of how are we really sharing risk in the euro system so we are sitting in constructive ambiguity which has served as well up to now but you know with this level of government debt and this large balance sheet the fiscal footprint of central banks is quite large not to address those questions and to have clear rules ex ante can undermine the credibility, and here you come to social capital, of the central banks. I remember the debt crisis, the SP did not work because it was not clear whether the government was supporting that kind of QE. The OMT announcement worked because the government authorities supported it. So that's to me, it's, you know, it kind of illustrates these issues of capital and resharing. Uh, now, on monetary fiscal coordination, I think that that uh, uh, vision of independence in which uh, the ECB cannot sit at the table with the fiscal authorities because this is violation of independence, is actually bonker. Okay? So that, I think that uh, uh, we need that kind of fiscal coordination. In fact, we have had it during COVID and this is why uh, we have been successful. Now, will we have it now? I think that's a question mark, right? So that in the new context of, of the Ukraine, but we better think about rules uh, that will uh, you know, facilitate that. And then there is the issues uh, of other things which are important in the treaty, no monetary financing. What does it mean? Okay, now that we have outright purchases, what is the interpretation? No, of, uh, no bailout, uh, I mean, Okay, so that I'm taking too much time, but uh, you know, I think this is quite uh, ambiguous. What does it mean, no monetary financing? This is, a, is an extra thing. A lot of central banks do not have that provision of no monetary financing. You know, independence and price stability mandate is, should be good enough, okay? So then, uh, you know. And uh, also, find, you know, no bailout, you know, that's to, 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 to uh, um, to Athenaeus' point, okay, so it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, what does this imply for collateral, what does this imply for financial assistance, so how strict and, you know, what is exactly that definition. Proportionality, I mean, this maybe is clear now after the legal issues with Germany, but, uh, you know, the better, we, you know, the more we clarify those issues, the better it will be, and that's the fiscal coordination story. Thank you. Claudio? Okay, well, thanks, Victor. <laughs> the, uh, this is an old debate. Um, but let me start by saying that uh, where do unrealistic expectations come from, regardless of uh, how you're thinking about it? That's basically from the belief that a particular objective can be achieved by the tools that you have and getting it wrong. Um, now, the uh, that regardless of the degree of sophistication, and you can have these debates at different degrees of sophistication, then the key question is, what do you think is feasible and not? And what do you think is feasible and not feasible depends on how you think the economy works, the, the paradigm through which you're actually looking at the world. And that's why issues like, for example, that, that have been dividing, say, uh, Athanasius and me on this question of the role of central banks in, in, in the context of financial and macroeconomic stability. My personal view, and let me stress that whatever I said even before, it's personal views, it's not necessarily the views of the BIS. My, my view has always been, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, that in a roughly in, uh, in mid-1980s, because of financial liberalization, because of globalization of the real economy, and because of the monetary policy regimes, we saw this fundamental change in the nature of the business cycle. And we didn't adjust. We didn't adjust to it. Um, we kept thinking that we had this great moderation that, to my mind, was in fact a great illusion. Now. You can argue with that, yes, no, but that, that was the interpretation. And indeed, from the, from the analytical perspective, I think that some of the issues that you've raised, I think I've regarded as weaknesses of the analytical frameworks that people have been using. Um, 
Now, within that, there is the question of the role of the financial cycle and inherent endogenous instability in the financial and macroeconomy. And there is also the role of uh, the view of what uh, monetary policy can and cannot do. Uh, now, something that I think monetary policy cannot do for a number of reasons, and there is a recent uh, research paper done with colleagues on this, is, for instance, fine-tuning inflation when it's very, very low for, quite a, for, for a number of reasons. And that is why I think that there is a particular role for monetary policy, not as the primary line of defense, but as a line of defense in this broader macroeconomic picture. But again, it depends very much on how you think the economy works. And uh, I can easily see why uh, sort of Athanasius and Lucrezia and myself may be in, in a different position. Pablo, for your two minutes. No, let me first perhaps uh, emphasize uh, that I fully agree with uh, the comment that was uh, uh, made by, by the third person who was intervening. I think most of the risk uh, to financial stability now are, are first are global, and, and second, are cross-sectoral. Uh, and if, this means that if we n are not able to, to provide an answer that is uh, global and uh, that incorporates all the regulators that are relevant, that are probably not only uh, in the financial sector, but that now uh, we should incorporate others that are in the non-financial sector, we want to be able to, to tackle uh, and mitigate uh, the risk that uh, are being uh, generated. And then on, on evaluation, I think well, the two institutions that probably were pioneering um, this idea of incorporating a, a permanent evaluation, uh, even creating a, a, a kind of a, a department uh, internally uh, uh, were the IMF and the UK. Uh, uh, we at the bank are, are, are doing something, something similar now. Uh, so we now, uh, the governing council of the, of the Bank of Spain approve, uh, uh, has to approve every year uh, an annual program for evaluation. So we have already done one on communication. We will uh, do this year one on our research, another on our forecast, and even on some of our micro supervisory uh, responsibilities. Okay, so we are trying also to, to bridge uh, that, uh, that gap. And the way to do it, uh, um, so to, to, to be uh, these uh, evaluations to be really independent, well, they have to be done by externals to the bank, this is clear. They have to report adequately, in particular in our case, to the overseen body, which is our governing, our governing council. And of course, uh, you need to communicate. You need to be transparent on the conclusions and the outcome of these uh, evaluations. Thank you. Thank you, Athanasius. Last thoughts from Boston. Uh, thank you. Across the river from Cambridge, actually, but I can see Boston from here. Okay. Let me touch on two issues. Uh, 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 first, the, uh, the question by, uh, by Vitor Constancio, uh, is, the, is the mandate appropriate? Would it help to uh, uh, pay more focus on the secondary objectives and help the ECB prioritize these objectives? Uh, so in my view, we need, to, we need to acknowledge how much progress was done with the uh, uh, ECB strategy review for the first time just uh, uh, last year. The ECB acknowledged that it is responsible for a number of other objectives in addition to uh, price stability. Uh, that's very important. But then I think uh, the way to think about it from the perspective of the central bank, when, when I look at the laundry list of secondary objectives of the, uh, of the, of the ACB, some of them are much, clo much more closely related to monetary policy than others. And, and I think the ACB could easily focus on the ones that are achievable with monetary policy relative to that. Let me give you an example. Uh, so. Uh, among the objectives of the ECB, we have uh, uh, the uh, protection of the, of the environment, uh, and, uh, technological advance, uh, and uh, promoting social and economic uh, cohesion. Well, among these three, only one of them really is truly economic and truly greatly influenced by monetary policy, and this is the promotion of uh, economic and social cohesion. Uh, uh, economic and social cohesion, ensuring that there would not be divergences in the euro area. So it would only be natural for the ECB to pay greater attention to that relative to, say, promoting technological advance uh, by funding some technical university, like MIT, by the way, you know, we would appreciate the funding, but I don't think it's the ECB's job to do something like that. So in, in my view, here and different a little bit from, from Lugresia, I think that the treaty is wonderfully written. And the ECB has the authority and has the tools to do much better than it has done 
in, uh, in many occasions in the past. And I want to close by, by, uh, by coming back to, uh, uh, to Claudio's comment about uh, the BIS uh, uh, missed uh, prediction uh, in early 2020. I think the BIS prediction in 2020 that the pandemic would uh, cause uh, a liquidity crisis and from that point on a severe uh, crisis was absolutely correct. Condition alone, the ECB following the policies that uh, it had followed the previous 10 years. It's entirely reasonable, uh, I think. And, and, and to me, this is all the things that give me hope for, for Europe and hope for how the ECB can better promote uh, uh, social capital and financial stability in Europe. What the ECB did in those two years uh, showed uh, how much good it can do by properly interpreting its mandate, properly using its authority and its tool within its, uh, within its uh, uh, powers uh, for, for improving uh, Europe. And let me end with this. Thank you. I say that the Maastricht Treaty has to be interpreted uh, in a transparent way. I mean, because actually, we just wrote a paper with uh, lawyers saying that everything that you say can be done within the Maastricht Treaty, provided uh, that the interpretation is clear. Okay. okay. Exactly. And the ACB has, has the discretionary authority to provide the correct interpretation. That's exactly my point. So okay, I, that's, I agree with you on this location. I, 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 I would say that's the perfect moment to close this panel. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> please give your applause to So we move directly to panel two. Okay, just one minute for technical arranging the floor. So we we'll start in one minute sharp. Okay. <laughs> for introducing this session. But there is um, something that I'd like to say uh, before, and that goes back to a speech by Janet Yellen in uh, October 16, where he provides some guidance on the fundamental policy questions that should be addressed by microeconomic research. And now I counter. My question asks whether individual difference within broad groups of actors in the economy can influence aggregate economic outcomes in particular, what effect does such heterogeneity have on the aggregate demand? And then she concluded, even though the tools of monetary policy are generally not well suited to achieve distributional objectives, 
it is important for policymakers to understand and monitor the effects of macroeconomic developments on different groups within society. Um, and the answer for this question was precisely the inclusion of heterogeneity in neo-Keynesian models. And today we'll have three um, interventions that uh, will deal with the importance of heterogeneity in uh, economics and on the understanding of the uh, monetary policy transmission mechanism. Uh, and to set the scene before that, we'll have um, uh, uh, additional contribution on the role of central banks in sustaining social capital. So we are very lucky to have again four distinguished participants in this panel. Antonella Trigari, very nice to have you in Lisbon for the first time at the bank, professor at the Pocorni University. Uh, Gabriel Macluff, Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, the same applies to you. Jordi Galli, who we visited many times before in the past, a professor at Cray, Universidad de Pompeu Fabra and the Barcelona School of Economics, and Juan Dolado, who of course visited us many times in the past, professor at the Universidad de Carlos III de Madrid. So we'll start precisely by the intervention by Gabriel Macluff, so the floor is yours for 10 minutes presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Pedro. Um, it, uh, thank you, Mario, for the invitation. Uh, certainly, this, this museum is uh, an extremely appropriate place to discuss uh, today's topic. Um, I, uh, the relationship between money, individuals, and human societies is, at the end of the day, at the core of what central banks uh, are about and in building or indeed uh, rebuilding social capital. One of the advantages of speaking on the second panel is you've had the benefit of uh, listening to some excellent contributions uh, from earlier speakers. Um, and I just wanted to just uh, note that. And, and let me, because some of what I was going to cover has already been covered, so uh, there'll be a more comprehensive set of r remarks uh, of mine that will be published, but I will. Um, skimp over them as we talk. But let me just start with, with actually the basics, which is what is social capital? Um, because there are many definitions and they date back to uh, uh, Aristotle in some cases. Um, and ultimately it's about how people connect to one another. And I like to think of it as the social uh, connections, attitudes and norms that contribute to societal well-being by promoting coordination and collaboration between people and groups in society. So that sounds uh, very nebulous for an audience of economists. Uh, and I'll avoid discussing payoff matrices, dominant strategies, and game theoretic equilibria, just to make my point. Um, but social capital is essential to what we central banks do every day and why we do it. But let's, let's go back to the beginning. I mean, we heard from uh, uh, Professor James earlier about the history of central banks, and he, and he mentioned uh, he mentioned some. I mean, if we go back to the very beginning of the first central bank, the Riksbank, um, the, uh, the Swedish uh, central bank, uh, it also uh, started um, really as a result of a crisis. And I think one of the themes um, in uh, the original central banks whether it's the Banco de Portugal or the Bank of England or the Sveriges Riksbank or even uh, the Banque de France, uh, there were particular um, objectives to avoid monetary disarray, if I can put it like that, whether it was to promote war or whether it was to de deal with the crisis. I think the Banco de Portugal was actually um, uh, set up at a point where the, uh, the, the, uh, the state was potentially on the edge of bankruptcy, as, as I understand it. Um, so money uh, is a symbol of stability, and uh, central banks play an important role in maintaining the stability, and history has shown us that. It may be obvious, but it's worth saying that the stability of money plays a critical role in the stability of society. And the role of money as a store of value, a unit of account, and a medium of exchange is an important instrument in how we, as individuals in society, connect with each other, whether through trade, commerce, and our everyday connections, uh, and hence in building social capital. And certainly in more recent history, the later wave of central banks, as Professor James was, was, uh, was telling us, um, 
were created for slightly different reasons, but I think at the end of the day, they were still about uh, promoting uh, stability. Um, and as we chart the history of central banks, um, uh, we can see their critical role in both providing uh, monetary and financial stability, and I'll, and I'll discuss a little bit um, later uh, some considerations beyond those two. But one point which I would like to uh, reiterate now is who central banks serve. Uh, and it's an important anchor, uh, anchor when thinking about our role. Uh, and since becoming uh, governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, um, a guiding principle for me has been a phrase from the original legislation uh, which established the bank uh, uh, nearly 80 years ago. We are much younger, uh, much younger than uh, the Banco de Portugal, although we're much older uh, than the ECB. Um, and I think uh, we should just bear that in mind. I might, I might come back to that a bit later on. But echoing the state's constitution, the original legislation that set up the Central Bank of Ireland said that our constant and predominant aim shall be the welfare of the people as a whole. And it's worth sort of, I think, remembering that. It's not a unique, incidentally, that statement is not unique to, uh, to the Central Bank of Ireland. Um, Social capital is ultimately about how we connect with each other, as I said, and it's clear that institutions matter for building social capital, and central banks, uh, as important institutions of the state, play a critical role. Um, the, the, uh, from my perspective, an important point I think we should uh, bear in mind and I think Lucretia earlier was, was sort of talking about it, maybe not as explicitly as I'm about to say, is I think central banks are part of an institutional ecosystem uh, that is interconnected. Um, uh, and notwithstanding that individual components of it may uh, act independent, independently or with autonomy. Um, and I think it's important that we all, certainly from my perspective, um, I don't, uh, it's, you know, we need to avoid believing that we act in a vacuum, and we need to avoid confusing our independence with isolation. Central banks cannot afford to be uh, isolated. Um, Douglas North defined institutions as the humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interactions. And economists from Adam Smith through to Durham, Achimoglu, and uh, James Robinson have explained the role that institutions have played in uh, development and in progress. Um, and, and this museum, incidentally, has got a number of artifacts in it, I think, which really sort of tell the, the story of uh, money as an institution and as a key instrument of uh, building social capital. Uh, and I'll just reference Cuba cloths, which are a form of money from the Congo in the 17th century. Um, and if you, th if you uh, do a bit of research on those uh, and you understand how they were made, which is essentially by the whole community and um, the role they played, which was almost beyond money, um, it gives you a sense of money as, this, uh, as, a, as, as social capital. Um, last word on institutions, I could say quite a lot, but I think Andy Haldane, the former Bank of England uh, chief economist, said that whether old or new, institutions seem to matter. Their secret lies in solving societal problems of, a, of knowledge, coordination, and incentives. Institutional memory can help lengthen and strengthen otherwise short and subjective minds, and institutional investment can help build public goods and flatten otherwise fat tails. So central banks are important institutions, um, and a common thread that enables all institutions to work is trust, and we heard earlier from Professor James on uh, the important role of uh, trust I think Kenneth Arrow, 50 years ago, uh, talked about virtually every commercial transaction has within itself an element of trust. Um, and uh, another aspect in this museum is uh, the silver leish, I think it's called, uh, coin, uh, which is struck, uh, I'm told, uh, in the Oporto Mint in the 1400s under the reign of King Afonso V. 
and Leish means loyal or honest. Um, I'm sure I've pronounced it uh, badly, but uh, my Portuguese isn't up to scratch, I know. But trust is, is, a critical, uh, is as critical today for central banks as it was for King Afonso V. Um, and it's essential for the transmission of monetary policy. And I think 50 years on, Kenneth Arrow's assertions remain uh, true. Uh, the financial system relies on trust and confidence, and central banks and regulators have a key role in ensuring the integrity uh, of the system um, and ultimately to protect the citizens of the state. Um, so we need social capital, but how do we uh, build it? Um, and as we heard earlier, I think from um, Claudio, uh, communications matter. Uh, expectation setting requires central banks to communicate clearly uh, both its objective and how it intends to achieve it. And transparency, honesty and engagement help to build credibility and to set expectations. And this requires, in turn, the public understand the mission of central banks and recognise the importance of that mission and trust us to uh, deliver it. Um, so it means effective central bank communication. And growing social capital or rebuilding social capital requires central banks to communicate in a way that is understandable to people and uh, speaks to issues that resonate with them. And we can't any longer rely on old intermediaries. We can't any longer rely on uh, traditional media uh, as the vehicles for communicating as those channels are actually disappearing. But let me just uh, touch on two issues which are beyond monetary and financial stability, um, which are, I think are relevant for us uh, to uh, just bear in mind. Um, one is the whole issue of uh, climate change and policies to address climate change that may appear costly in a short time horizon, but deliver large net benefits in a longer horizon. We need to act in response to uh, those challenges. But I think, as we heard earlier about the whole issue of exaggerated expectations, one thing we need to be very clear on uh, is that central banks cannot solve the problem of climate change. Um, and sometimes I worry that one of the risks we carry is that we uh, allow ourselves to be presented by others sometimes as uh, the institutions that can solve the problem of climate change. Well, let me tell you, uh, we cannot, uh, because the challenge requires action on the part of the whole community, businesses, households, uh, as well as policymakers. Um, in the central banking community. I want to just touch on inequality um, because I think it's another issue that goes beyond uh, traditional areas where central banks certainly have a role. My colleague Isabel Schnabel um, uh, talked about the effects of technology um, on uh, creating e income inequality recently and also the reduction in bargaining power for workers. From my perspective, inequality is something that central banks do need to pay close attention to because inequality uh, has economic consequences and we can't uh, pretend they don't and we need to understand how those economic uh, consequences, what the implications of them are on social capital, because there are some. And I think when inequality impacts social capital, it impacts uh, ultimately on the ecosystem that central banks operate within and the trust that the public has in that ecosystem. On the other hand, I think what's also clear is that we do not have the mandate or tools to deal with uh, society's concerns about excess income or wealth inequality. Governments are best placed to do that. But in our decisions, in our decisions, the Governing Council does take uh, proportionality into account and does need to understand the implications of its decisions. So let me just conclude by saying three things, uh, if I may. Um, firstly, as I said, uh, 
central banks need social capital to succeed. Uh, secondly, social capital is an important determinant of a community's well-being. Alongside, I would suggest, human capital, natural capital, financial and physical capital, which incidentally, all together, I like to describe as, as our economic capital. But that's a discussion for another conference at another time. The fact is that social capital does not grow on its own. An economy, um, a society, the environment are all complex systems that constantly interact with each other. And we need to invest uh, in the architecture and infrastructure, uh, including institutions such as central banks to enable social capital to grow. And thirdly, um, implicit, if not explicit, in what I just said, stasis is not an option. Um, the frameworks in which we operate uh, cannot um, be left to atrophy, and we have to be prepared um, to uh, challenge ourselves um, to look at ideas that, to quote Keynes, ramify in every corner of our minds, uh, and be prepared to accept that paradigms that we agreed to, uh, whether it's 30 years ago in Maastricht or at some other point of time, are fit for purpose, uh, not just for today, but actually for the future in which we operate in. Um, at the end of the day, it's social capital that is going to be foundational for the world uh, that central banks ultimately live in and have to deliver. And if I can just finish by paraphrasing Jose Saramago, who is one of my favorite authors. Uh, he once wrote that the history of Portugal was not that of Europe, but that the history of Europe would be unimaginable without that of Portugal. And if I can paraphrase him, um, uh, I think the, uh, the, social, uh, the history of central banks is not that of social capital, but strong social capital would be uh, difficult to deliver without successful central banks. I look forward to the discussion. Obrigado. Thank you very much, and in particular for your kind reference to José Saramac. We move now to Antonella, please. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to break the tradition and standing and having slides, uh, but I'm going to be followed in the panel. So let me start by saying that it's uh, really an honor to be here today and part of this panel. And let me thank Mario for inviting me and Pedro for this very efficient and very careful preparation of the panel. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, and what I'm going to do today, I'm going to take a, a very specific focus on the full employment or maximum employment mandate at the Fed and the ECB. And in particular, I'm going to uh, clarify what we mean by the full employment mandate. I'm going to go through some uh, practical hurdles and difficulties associated to this mandate. Then I'm going to briefly go through how it has been uh, revised or not revised at the recent monetary policy reviews of the Fed and the ECB. And finally, I will conclude with some thoughts about whether the current economic conjuncture of elevated inflation is putting some pressure and challenges on this revised monetary policy framework. So let me start by making the distinction between the different legal mandates of the Fed and the ECB and the common monetary policy strategy. So the Fed has a dual mandate. It has been mentioned a few times. The Federal Reserve Act mandates that the Fed conduct monetary policy so as to promote the goals of maximum employment and stable prices. The ECB has what I will call a hierarchical mandate. So the primary objective of the ECB is of the monetary policy of the ECB is to maintain price stability, but the treaty adds that without prejudice to the objective of price stability, the ECB should also support 
the general economic policies in the European Union, contributing to the achievement on the Union's objective. We mentioned there is a long list of them, but among those, and this is very much emphasized in ECB documents, we do have full employment. Now, in practice, de facto, the two um, um, central banks conduct a common monetary policy strategies, which has been uh, referred to, I think uh, um, this is due to Lars Benson a, a few years ago, as flexible inflation targeting, where here flexible is in contrast to strict inflation targeting, the idea being that any inflation targeting central bank does not only target inflation, but also put some weights on stabilizing the real economy. And the ECB in particular has emphasized that the medium term orientation that it takes in pursuing the price stability goals provides room for monetary policy to take into account considerations such as maximum employment in particular when or in response to adverse shocks that create some trade-offs between the objectives of uh, stabilizing in the short term employment and inflation. Now, within, so I'm going to take this framework as a basis. So within this framework, I'm going to argue that a key input to monetary policy are measures of labor market slack or measures of labor market underutilization. And uh, why? Because these are going to be relevant to assess the progress toward both goals, maximum employment, a secondary goal for the ECB, and price stability. In particular, uh, measures of labor market slack do provide, first of all, a measure of the cyclical position of the economy, uh, or the cyclical position of the labor market in particular, and they are key when it comes to managing the trade-off that may arise when, as I was saying, supply shock move output and inflation in opposite direction. Indeed, managing this trade-off uh, precisely means uh, assessing whether short-term inflationary pressures are acceptable, given the state of the labor market, given the state of the economy. Now, second uh, measure of labor market slack are key because they provide an indicator of demand-related uh, inflationary or deflationary pressures. Uh, if in a tight labor market where you have many jobs and few uh, workers searching for jobs, it's going to be the case that uh, there are going to be upward pressures on wages, production costs, and this is, of course, a key determinant of price inflation. Now, measuring labor market slack uh, presents two main challenges. Uh, these are measurement challenges, but these are, I think, key challenges. The first one is, which is the best indicator of labor market slack? Traditionally, policymakers and uh, academics have been focusing on the unemployment rate as the main uh, measure of labor market underutilizations. But the unemployed are not the only group searching for jobs, as uh, it's uh, clear from the fact that we do have very large flows from inactivity to employment, and from employment to employment. And moreover, uh, job seekers are heterogeneous, because they have different, what I'm going to call, effective labor supplies, different propensity to look for jobs. For example, some workers, despite wanting a job, they may provide less search effort because they, they are discouraged. So these margin attached workers will have uh, lower job finding rates than, for example, unemployed workers. So the, the consequence of this is that central banks typically do not focus on any single indicator. They go beyond the unemployment rate, they look at measures such as, for example, U4 that also includes the discouraged worker, or U5 that includes the margin attached worker. The second challenge uh, is uh, that knowing the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate by itself on any other indicator does not tell us if we are at full employment. We need to compare 
the actual rates, the actual indicators to some benchmark rates that are not observable, not directly measurable, and they are hard to, to estimate. So and let me just quickly refer to a very, I think, nice paper by Kramp et al, where they tried to put some order on this uh, plethora of indicators and names in the literature, providing two main categories of benchmarks. They call it a longer run unemployment rate to which the economy should converge after adjusting to business cycle shock, and a stable price unemployment rate, which is the rate at which there are no inflationary or deflationary pressures. Now, the alternative indicators that are used by central banks to capture hidden labor market slack, what they do, they typically count number of job seekers. So implicitly what they do, they assign the same weight to all the seekers independently of their effective labor supply. An ideal uh, measure of effective job seekers, which is what you see in the slides, ST, should instead you know, sum all the job seekers but weigh them by their uh, search intensity. Of course, the challenge is measuring search intensity, and one approach that has been taken in the literature is to proxy relative search intensity with relative job finding rates. Now, for the, for the US, a recent, um, a recent paper uh, by Abram and Cotters estimates relative job finding rates for as much as 22 groups and constructs such an effective job seekers rate. And they find that these effective job seeker rates provide additional information relative to, for example, the unemployment rate or other slack uh, indicators. Now, in work I did for the Sintra Forum a few months ago, I tried to do the same for the Euro area. And what I could do is obtain relative job finding rates for six group of workers based on the uh, data uh, that is disseminated by its um, European Union LFS data disseminated by Eurostat. And so that was what I could get. And so what I want, and I'm going to come back later on that, what I want to raise here is a critical issue, which is Euro area data availability. In this particular case, transition rates were available from 2011 only for selected Euro area countries, not for, key mar not for Germany and not for key margins given the Euro area institutional framework. <coughs> so, <coughs> Um, so let me uh, come to the revised monetary policy frameworks. In 2020, the Fed, and in 2021, the ECB. So there was a shared revision to the approach for achieving price stability, though with uh, non-negligible differences. But the Fed also implemented a revision on the employment mandate. And in particular, in the statement for the longer run goals of monetary policy, the Fed now defined maximum employment as a broad based and inclusive goal. And it also provides, um, it also articulates a strategy to achieving this maximum employment. In particular, the Fed is going to stabilize shortfalls of employment from maximum employment as opposed to deviation from the maximum level. So let me briefly tell you the logic behind this. So the logic is that while the Fed recognizes that monetary policy is a blunt tool to target certain categories of disadvantaged workers, it also recognizes that hot economy, long expansions are very beneficial for the most disadvantaged workers and they tend to reduce labor market differential quite significantly. So why shortfall and not symmetric deviation? This uh, refers to the limits of using maximum employment as a monetary policy tool, the idea being that this is a non-observable, uh, difficult to measure, imprecisely estimate object, and so you wouldn't be concerned about high employment unless it comes together with unwanted inflationary pressures, which lead to this no preemptive uh, tightening of monetary policy in face of inflationary pressures. Now, the emphasis is on the distributional effects, and in particular, the Fed conducted this Fed listens event to build social trust, where the emphasis was 
uh, getting in touch with the communities, in particular the most disadvantaged communities, and uh, on tailored communication to these communities. Now, while the ECB implemented no formal revision to the employment mandate, it simply reaffirmed the medium-term orientation of the price stability goal, the review came with very far-reaching discussion along the same lines of those that took place at the Fed, and that generated a change in the employment leg of the mandate, as uh, it's documented in, in background documents uh, 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 that were provided before the, the review. So let me skip these slides because I'm already a bit late, but what I want to, <coughs> to just to mention is that here there are there are indeed, there is large evidence of benefits from uh, you know, a hot economy with long expansion narrowing differentials, in particular in unemployment rates. And uh, I also want to, to point to this, I think, very interesting paper, which I just re recently came in touch with. It's, it's called The Elusive State of Full Employment, which is very much related uh, to the, um, the uh, benefits of a hot economy. So let me just uh, um, go with my last slides. So uh, possibly naive, but I think very natural question, is uh, uh, whether the current economic conjuncture, conjuncture with these elevated inflation rates is posing some uh, challenges to, the, to these new frameworks. And <clears throat> I'm going to say just a couple, uh, uh, two, one minute. Uh, so first of all, I think that there is no, so I, I, I thought about it, I came to the conclusion that there is absolutely no contradiction with the revised framework and the current challenges. The revised framework have room and provide guidance for an appropriate response to adverse supply shocks tighten monetary policy to some extent by trading off inflation and activity and of course tolerating some inflation in face of this temporary supply shock. Of course, this is uh, easy in theory, difficult in practice, especially given the, the very high uncertainty associated, moreover, uh, now exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. So the risk is you know, between doing too much and too soon and risking a recession versus too little too late with the risk of losing the inflation anchor. So um, one point is uh, about the inflation anchor. So, um, but maybe I should just go to the third point because I see sign. So both central banks have uh, uh, very strongly emphasized that the response to the current situation is going to be data dependent. So what I want to mention is this is fine and this is very understandable and very appreciable, but what data is really key is going to be data on, of course, the measurement of long-term inflation expectation. and. and also data on measurement of labor markets lack, and, and I would argue that we are not there yet. I may have the occasion to comment on this later on. So the broader message, and I'll conclude, is that central bank can greatly, and in particular, I think the ECB can greatly contribute to, uh, to providing better, more granular, and micro data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. What is the call for more data, which of course is a very important message for uh, statistical authorities. Jordi, now the floor is yours. So we'll revert the order next time, given time constraints. So if there is any question for the floor, please be ready when this round of interventions uh, conclu is concluded. Jordi, please. Okay, well, thank, let me thank the Bank of Portugal uh, for the, this kind of invitation to participate uh, in this uh, conference, which I'm enjoying very much. And let me just go to the point of my presentation. The panel is on welfare considerations beyond price stability, so I thought it would be you know, useful to remind ourselves what the case for price stability is, and then to, to try to make a case for deviating from price stability, at least occasionally. So, um, so why do we want why do we want central banks to to set a target for inflation, a long run target for inflation at least? Okay, let's 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 think about the long run first. Well, because uh, 
um, you know, with letting inflation drift away um, without a clear anchor would certainly make uh, decisions by private agents more difficult. Okay, it would um, make uh, the possibility of, of long-term contracts, you know, in, in many different uh, areas of the economy, hard and so on. So I think there's wide agreement that we want a long-term inflation goal that anchors inflation expectations and that fa facilitates ec uh, economic decisions. Uh, now, uh, how high should this inflation target be, this long-run inflation target be? Well, we know inflation by itself in a world in which not all, everyone takes, uh, adjusts prices and wages continuously generates uh, relative uh, price distortions. Uh, so we want that, in principle, we want that inflation to be as low as possible, as close to zero as possible, but we know that there are also reasons like downward nominal wage rigidities, the existence of a zero lower bound that suggest that we may want to go above zero a bit. And most central banks have adopted this principle. Now, but that leaves open the question of the short run, okay? Uh, in the short run, how should central banks respond to deviations of inflation from that target that we, let's uh, assume that we all agree on the long run target? Well, I think there are two important cases to, to, uh, or two uh, scenarios to distinguish. The first one is purely uh, theoretical because it doesn't happen in reality, but it's useful okay, for thinking about this. Suppose that nominal rigidities, the, fi the fact that pr you know, prices are sticky, that wages are sticky, were the only friction, on the only distortion in the economy. Now, in that case, uh, what I call natural output, that is the equilibrium level of activity that one would observe in the absence of those uh, um, nominal frictions, would be efficient by definition, okay? And that would be the, the, the level of activity that uh, one would want to aim at. Now, so central banks would like to replicate this natural level of economic activity, and this calls for uh, strict inflation targeting, okay? Stabilize inflation at the target, why? Because if, if you stabilize inflation, that means that agents, workers, firms, are happy with their current markups. And that's exactly the situation that they would have if there were no uh, nominal rigidities. Okay? So, and that's what has been called the divine coincidence. By, sta by stabilizing inflation, you replicate uh, the desirable allocation. Now, there is a subtle issue, which is what inflation measure to stabilize. And that depends on details, uh, depends on uh, what are the nominal variables that are sticky in the economy? Is it more wages? Is it more prices? And, you know, uh, there are different sectors that are maybe subject to, to different shocks that call for changes in relative prices. Um, and then the question is which, how much weight to, well, to put on, on the price of each sector in, 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 in computing the, the, the kind of inflation measure that you want to stabilize. But this has been uh, studied in the literature and, and, and it calls typically for for stabilizing uh, some weighted average of uh, different uh, inflation measures. Let's put that aside, but now let's consider the case that is more interesting, which is the case in which there are frictions in the economy beyond nominal rigidities. There are real frictions, real imperfections, distortionary taxes, uh, f f uh, frictions in labor markets, imperfections in financial markets, and so on. Now, in those, ca in those cases, the, the natural level of output will be different from the efficient level of output. And now, what should the central bank aim at in that case? Well, a case is, it can be made to, for the central bank to aim at a level of activity that is somewhere in between what we would call the natural level of output, the, the one that would be consistent with stable inflation, and the efficient level of output, which implies a deviation from the natural level of output and hence may lead to a deviation from stable inflation. But of course, it brings the economy closer to what would be the efficient level of uh, economic activity. Okay, so this calls for what we could call uh, um, control deviations from the long-run inflation target. Okay, so the central bank uh, accepts that temporarily in response to certain shocks and because of these uh, real imperfections, it is not desirable to, uh, you know, to try to, to stabilize inflation at the target in a, con in a continuous basis no matter what the cost is. Okay? Now, uh, all this is typically, this, this kind of reasoning is, is, is typically um, done in the context of, uh, of, of models with a representative agent. If you have heterogeneous households, there are some 
additional things to take into account. I mean, the central bank will not be able to change permanently the distribution of income or the distribution of wealth. That should be clear. But at the margin, in the short run, it can, it can um, conduct policy in a way that uh, avoids uh, large deviations of marginal utilities of consumption. Okay? Uh, but again, at the margin, without tr trying to or without uh, pretending to be able to, to change permanently that distribution of income, like because like uh, climate change, the that's not, uh, that's not something that the central bank can can change permanently. Okay, so let me ma give you an example, an illustration of this principle of uh, why it may be optimal to deviate uh, from 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 uh, inflation targeting in the context of uh, an economy in which there, is, there are some real imperfections. And in this case, it, the real imperfection has to do with a financial market. Okay? So this is based on, on some work with uh, uh, Frédéric Boisset, Fabrice Collard, and Christina Manea. And let me just give you the ingredients of our model. It's a model, uh, it's, a it's a New Keynesian model that uh, is able to, to generate endogenous financial crisis. The fact that financial crises are endogenous makes, it, makes room for the central bank to preempt uh, uh, those uh, financial crises. So that's why we think this is particularly interesting. So it's, 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 a, it's a standard New Keynesian model with nominal rigidities that make monetary policy non neutral. There is endogenous capital accumulation that makes the, uh, that uh, generates the possibility of protracted investment boom, booms. There are idiosyncratic productivity shocks. Some firms become more productive than others. And that calls for a reallocation of capital through credit markets. Okay, so they, that's the heterogeneity that, um, that um, um, justifies or, or makes a case for financial markets to, to play a role reallocating capital from less productive firms to more productive firms through credit markets. But there are, those credit markets are uh, subject to some frictions, the private information and limited enforcement. Okay? And that makes a, uh, generates a situation in which uh, those credit markets may be fragile in the sense that may actually collapse. Okay? And if um, credit markets collapse, then this, this desirable reallocation of resources from less productive to more productive firms may, uh, um, may, may fail. Okay, so in particular, uh, the um, credit markets may collapse if the, um, return to, uh, to the marginal return to capital, the return on investment, falls below a certain threshold. Okay? And the reason is that this return on capital is a cap on the interest rate that firms will be willing to, to uh, uh, which firms will be willing to, to borrow. And if, if the interest rate in financial markets is too low, firms that are less productive will have an incentive, instead of uh, you know, uh, reallocating their resources towards uh, the, through credit markets to the more productive firms, they will have an incentive to borrow and essentially run away uh, with that money, that is to, or, or to put it in, 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 in unproductive uh, activities and just uh, and eventually default. Okay? And so that, that um, uh, leads to, to, to some incentive com compatibility constraint uh, that um, in case that the return on capital goes below that threshold, uh, leads to, the, to a, the situation in which there is no equilibrium in credit market. Okay? No, no interest rate at which you know, the supply of, of, of capital uh, equates the, the, the demand for capital. Now, an, in, an investment boom, even if it's caused by fundamental factors, say a, a, a boom in productivity, uh, may increase the financial fragility. Why? Because it leads to a high capital stock will tend to reduce uh, the, the return on capital. Okay? So if the reasons for that f um, investment boom disappear, okay, uh, then there is a situation in which there is capital overhang, there's too much capital in the economy relative to fundamentals, and the return on capital is too low. And that is a situation in which the economy is very fragile, and any small disturbance, uh, uh, adverse disturbance, may uh, generate this, this, um, this collapse of credit markets and what we call the financial crisis. So in that environment, a greater focus on output stability from the central bank uh, is desirable. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a second some simulations that, that, that show that. Uh, because uh, um, outputs to, by, by stabilizing the level of economic activity, you, uh, the central bank will uh, prevent uh, this excessive capital, eventual, eventually excessive capital accumulation. Of course, this comes at a price, which is a deviation from, from the inflation target in the short run. Uh, 
So let me show you um, a table that, uh, that illustrates this. So again, this is based on a, a, the simulation of a calibrated version of this model. So um, here you have the welfare losses uh, in, a, in an economy without financial frictions. Our economy, but without financial frictions. And if the, the central bank follows a strict inflation targeting uh, policy, that is, if it stabilizes inflation at all times, then welfare, that's the optimal policy, OK? And welfare losses are uh, zero. Now, let's suppose that the central bank you know, follows a more realistic policy that consists of a Taylor rule, that is, it responds to inflation and it responds to output. And we assume that the response to inflation is with a coefficient 1.5, as John Taylor proposed in his famous paper. And what we're going to do here is to play with the coefficient on output. So a larger value for the coefficient on output means that the central bank puts more weight on stabilizing output. So as you can see in this frictionless economy, a stabilizing output generates welfare losses. Okay? It's undesirable because it is just optimal to, to stabilize inflation. Stabilizing output leads to a deviation of output from uh, the efficient uh, level of output. And you know, it, it's in principle uh, desirable for the central bank to accommodate uh, changes in output that match uh, the, the efficient level of output. OK, so this is an economy in which fully uh, focusing on, on price stability would be desirable. But let's move now to an economy in which we introduce financial frictions. Okay? Of course, in that economy, a strict inflation targeting will not replicate the first best, because that's not attainable. Okay, so we have some welfare losses, but what we see, okay, and this is the main result of our, of our analysis, is that as you um, increase the, as the central bank increases the coefficient on output, welfare losses may actually go down. Okay, why do welfare losses go down? Largely because the, the incidence of financial crisis goes down. There are fewer financial crises because there are fewer instances in which there is this excessive capital accumulation that puts the economy into, in, a, in a situation of extreme uh, financial fragility. So again, this is just an illustration of, of uh, a good reason why central banks would want to deviate from, from price stability. And also, I think it's a, 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 an interesting illustration of uh, a trade-off that uh, central banks face between the short run and the medium run. Okay? In the short run, uh, the, the central bank may have an incentive to, to stick to, to, to its uh, uh, inflation uh, uh, target. But by doing this, it, it, uh, it is, um, it, 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 you know, it's increasing the probability that somewhere down the road, uh, a financial crisis will emerge. Now, it is the independence of central banks that makes it possible, at least in principle, not to fall to that uh, temptation of forget about the medium run and to uh, 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 you know, accept and even engineer deviations from price stability in the short run to avoid this uh, uh, larger welfare losses uh, down the road. Thank you very much, Jordi. So Thank you. now we'll move from financial frictions to labor market frictions. Juan, please. So, happy birthday, Banco de Portugal. This is a very special occasion because I don't think that any of us will be able to celebrate our own 175th anniversary in the future. So, my paper, my, it's the last talk, so I'll try to, to, to be as entertaining as possible to keep you awake. Uh, the paper is uh, whether uh, in a, or my intervention is about whether uh, central banks should bother about inequality. I, I, I must confess, I don't really understand too well what is social capital, but what I know for sure is that it is associated, I don't claim any causal effect, with inequality, especially inequality of opportunities, which is the one that really matters. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is just summarize sort of the traditional view and the alternative view. The traditional view uh, is somewhat what it was defended by, by the governor of the Bank of Ireland. Distributional issues should be side effects of central bank policies whose main goal should be to stabilize the economy as a whole. There is the alternative view, which is growing, that monetary policy could have non-negligible direct effects on inequality, and I will describe the few channels, especially a business cycle, but that there could be persistent 
which interact, and this is what is important, with the propagation me mechanism of monetary policy. And I think this has been uh, illustrated very well by the growing influence of uh, heterogeneous models in the conduct of uh, monetary policy, the so-called Hank heterogeneous agents, neo keynesian models, and also the, the use of uh, the literature in labor markets where it come from of uh, abundant uh, frictions in the, in the search and matching, and matching process. So I, I will claim that the interaction of the two is going to be crucial in showing that the, the uh, inequality effects of monetary policy should not be disregarded. So uh, that's something I talked, by the way, in my intervention at the ECB forum in uh, last year. But today I will expand in, in, a few, in a few issues. OK, so let me just remind you very briefly that there are many channels through which uh, monetary policy affects inequality. They, uh, probably the most famous one is the saving redistribution channel. I'm talking about, just to focus attention, expansion and monetary policy uh, illustrated by, by a cut, an unexpected cut of one percentage points in interest rate. So that's going to benefit borrowers and hard lenders, so that's going to decrease inequality in principle if, they, if, the, if the borrowers are, the, are, are poorer than the lenders. The interest uh, sensitivity channel, so lower interest rate is going to increase assets, assets especially uh, variable income assets are in the hands of the, of the richer, so that's going to increase the inequality, also lower interest costs. The inflation channel, of course, the most popular one, which is, of course, that harms, and this has been uh, highly documented or, uh, uh, in the literature, that uh, inflation harms the poorer, so that's going to increase inequality. And then, of course, there is, of course, other effects, like, for instance, access to financial markets. If we are in expansionary framework, uh, individuals will access with less access to the financial markets should have uh, more opportunities to access it, so that's going to decrease inequality. And what I'm going to argue is that uh, here, in, this, in computing these channels, uh, heterogeneity is going to be crucial, because uh, as I said before, depends who you are, how you are going to be affected. Uh, to get uh, uh, just some uh, your attention, um, there is a recent paper by these authors uh, listed there in the uh, Journal of Finance uh, where they use uh, the Nordic countries always have these incredible databases for all sorts of stream, for all sorts of issues which they uh, also make available to researchers. So they have the whole population of Denmark balance sheets and, and they compute in a model because Denmark pegs the crown to the euro, so that somewhat a, a change uh, in the euro can be, can be, can be assimilated to be a, a, a shock for them. Uh, and they, the, what they compute is in the horizontal axis you have the, uh, the percentile of income of the individuals in, in Denmark, the adult individuals in Denmark, and they per compute, they simulate what would be the effect uh, of a cut uh, of a, an expansionary monetary policy shock, as the one I described before. What you see is uh, for the poorer individuals, those in the lower percentage, there is a fall in income relative to the lack of this shock of about two percentage points in, in, this po in, in total income, capital and labor income, whereas those at the bottom make uh, gains of about uh, three and a half percentage points. So that's, this, this is a very important result because it's like the aggregation of the previous one. What I want to highlight here is that uh, there is a, another effect uh, which is related to capital. This is a sort of Martian effect, uh, which a Marxist effect, which hasn't been, hasn't been highlighted enough, which is that uh, uh, capital, uh, especially capital equipment, is complementary to some types of workers. So typically, like in a skill bias, technological progress, etc., uh, 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 capital, uh, capital equipment increases the marginal productivity of capital, but having the marginal productivity of high skilled workers, but having more skilled workers also increases the marginal productivity of capital. So that, that's a virtual cycle, whereas on the other hand, Ma most of this capital, especially with the arrival of automation and the arrival of artificial intelligence, etc., is replacing low-skilled workers. 
So it's not only reducing the marginal productivity, it's not only uh, substituting uh, uh, low-skilled workers, but it's, it's eliminating their jobs. So on top of that, when we look at the, the frictions that the workers fa face in the, in the labor market, what we see is that they are not equal. Less skilled workers have much higher separation rates. They have lower matching efficiency for a basic reason that I will highlight in two slides, which is that uh, uh, low-skilled workers can only perform low-skilled jobs, where high-skilled workers can perform both high-skilled and low-skilled jobs. So that's why the margin efficiency is uh, it's higher. And finally, they have less uh, Nash bargaining power because, of course, they are more substitutable. So uh, the, 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 the basic mechanism leading to highlight through these two channels is, of course, you suppose we uh, engine a, a, monet in a expansion and monetary policy that increases investment and aggregate demand, that increases the relative demand for complementary and more flu fluid high skill HS uh, workers. That, of course, as the second round, increases the marginal productivity of capital, so that leads to higher investment, higher relative demand, and so on and so forth. So we have a very clear demand amplif amplification effect. Okay? The two forces are crucial in generating that, and uh, uh, having the two forces is lead to an effect which is much stronger than, uh, than, um, than having the two separate. So an economy just with capital skill complementarity or an economy only with asymmetric search and matching frictions. I'll, 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 I'll speed up a little bit. So uh, this, uh, when one highlights this with the data, uh, you, you, you basically find that expansionary monetary policy, for instance, in the US, this is the employment ratio between high skill and low skill workers. You see that the, an unexpected uh, in, uh, uh, cut in interest rate increases the employment rate of the high skill and increases the wage premium, increases the two parts of the labor earnings uh, 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 differential. Um, for instance, if you are talking about credit, uh, there is recent literature using uh, Colombian data, which also shows that uh, when, you, when you look at not a cut in interest rate, but a credit supply shock, uh, for instance, coming from macroprudential uh, policy, etc. What you see is that there you have again the the percentiles of the wage distribution in the, uh, uh, the horizontal axis and the changes in the in, in the vertical axis. What you see is that again that is the less skilled who suffer suffer the most. So what, that's the uh, last slide. Don't <laughs> don't get worried. So now what do we do these days? What do we do uh, with the tapered tantrum? Uh, at, the, at the time of gas, gas fraction, as uh, our, is, is getting called. So according to this argument that, that I just developed, uh, it's going to be lower investment, uh, and that lower investment is going to lead to less demand for high-skilled workers, so inequality should get reduced. That, that's the, 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 the flip side of the reasoning that I gave you before. But of course, and this is where the, the previous asymmetry comes back, Remember that production is asymmetric. Uh, High-skilled people can perform both jobs. Uh, they ro a, rock, uh, a rock scientist uh, can be both a rock scientist and a bartender, but the uh, dropout can only be a bartender. It cannot be a rock scientist. So that it means that the, as these high skill are losing their jobs, they enter the market for less skilled people. And of course, as they enter the market for less skilled people, labor supply increases and wages are going down. So it seems that whatever the central banks are doing, the dangers of enhancing this uh, short run or middle run uh, inequality are there. It doesn't matter whether it is expansionary or, more or, 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 or deflationary. So what, what should we do now? Uh, I mean, uh, is the, put, the central bank put dead? It's completely dead with the, with the Ukraine, with the Russian aggression to Ukraine. I think uh, we have a negative supply shock. So what we should implement, what the central bank should implement is, is of course, on, on fiscal policy, is a positive supply shock. So a positive, how do, you, how do we engine a, 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 monetary, a positive monetary supply shock? Well, we need a targeted approach. We need, for instance, that the TL, uh, TLTRO uh, uh, is much more targeted than what it is now. 
we really need to aim at facilitating credit conditions, etc., and buying of asset purchases of firms which are uh, betting for for, FOSA, for for green energies and for fossil energies, and of course of firms which are inefficiently automatizing, uh, automatizing and therefore eliminating jobs that otherwise otherwise would be uh, would be feasible. And that's the end of my intervention. Thank you very much, Juan. So <clears throat> I skip my questions. Uh, there will be no surprise for the speakers. And uh, unless there is, um, there are questions from the floor. Which there is one there. So just one final question, please. Uh, hi, thank you so much for that. It was very interesting. This is a very quick question for the last um, presentation. I was wondering if the paper you mentioned with the lower interest rate for 1%, given, and then you had that chart about the people with less income and more income, if you had a similar one but for an increase of 1%, or if the paper includes that, because I'd be curious to know what happens if it increases. Um, well, the paper I cited uh, is, is a paper of mine. And there we just simulate a expansionary monetary policy. Because remember, what we do is we use a production function which has this characteristic of what is called capital skill complementarity. So more capital goods, more marginal productivity of high skilled workers. But we don't model the asymmetry in the fact that we should have two production functions, one for complex jobs and another one for simple jobs. So simple jobs can be performed by both high-skilled and less-skilled workers, whereas complex jobs can only be performed. That's why I didn't, I didn't provide a, a graph for, for, for a contractionary monetary policy. That, that was the reason. But I'm, I'm, I'm working on this subject now. So soon I'll be able to. Thank you. That was the other thing I was going to say, actually, that I think it's not that easy sometimes for high-skilled workers to go to low-skilled workers. Sometimes they don't know how, and other times they don't want to. You know, there's sure. this. So I, mean, I think it would be interesting to have that side. There are very rich implications. For instance, you have, can have a very large increase in within skill inequality. Think, for instance, that the rock scientist becomes a, a bartender because they, they lost the job. So what's going to happen? What is going to happen is the current owner of the bar uh, uh, is going to offer uh, this person a lower wage than, uh, than what is offering to a dropout because they know that eventually they will leave. The moment that the rock scientist vacancy arrives, he will leave or she will leave. Therefore, within those with very high education, you will see the effects of this overeducation also an increase in, in within uh, inequality, within wage inequality. So very rich implications of this uh, viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Let me conclude by warmly thanking the speakers. Uh, I mean, the inclusion of heterogeneity in monetary policy framework is uh, extremely important from accountability and explainability of central banks and challenging familiar paradigms uh, as you do uh, is the best way to erode the social capital by ignoring changes. Um, and with that, uh, I think that I'm authorized to thank all the participants in the conference and uh, in the panels, um, and the participants from the public, which um, participate very actively. And uh, with that, and of course, to all the staff of the bank that uh, so well prepared this meeting. And with that, uh, I will bring it over to you, Isabel, just oh, to close the session. Okay. Yeah.